All right. I believe that oh we God. are live, and I hope that my window isn't open and I'm going to hear myself in a second because that's so annoying. Hi, are you a man? Are you a gay man? Are you a bisexual man? Are you not necessarily either of those things, yet you care about the well being of the homosexual? or at least part-time homosexual male community, and you've noticed that feminism is not helping, it is totally making things worse, and then demanding that we say thank you for the fact that they're making things worse. Or maybe you are a former adult star that is in the dark right now, is, is, is um, smirking in the dark at us, who is recently gone on the YouTube scene and even had a hit piece written about him in, uh, I believe it was Vice, um, about his support of the men's movement. Um, I have all sorts of questions to ask this person, but first introduce yourself, Philip. Hi, uh, my name is Philip Tanzer. I'm better known as Logan McCree. And uh, yeah, I, I'm originally German, so please excuse me if my English is sometimes a little bit uh, yeah, wonky. Uh, I live in Scotland now, and uh, till a couple of years ago, I uh, performed as a gay porn actor in, for Raging Stallion Studios in San Francisco. Yeah, he's the guy with lots of tattoos. Like, I imagine people are going to start, like, looking up in the Googles. And, uh, yeah, he's one with, with, with all the tattoos. I don't watch pornography myself. I never really I do. Got... I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I never really got into it. I think that by the time I would have been looking at porn, I was already in New York City living in dorms when I was, like, 18, 19. And I had straight roommates living in literally the same room as me. And so it never seemed like an option to, like start looking at photos and masturbating and then also i was living in new york city and i was kind of cute so I, I started dating a lot and i had sex and i was like oh why, why porn who cares and so i never i never i'm not really familiar so I, I i don't have i think a lot of gay guys have this um like maybe uh uh uncomfortable uncomfortableness around um adult film actors um i don't have that my biggest experience is actually just knowing them and being friends with them in real life <laughs> so okay. that's that's me <laughs> yeah they can actually be real people not yeah. all of them are. <laughs> no not all of them some of them are weird wacky aliens that are strung out on drugs and have no soul <laughs> yeah that is yeah well I I, w I would say they didn't start out without a soul, but I would say it's part of the drug abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've I've actually known some 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 really unfortunate experiences of um, knowing guys that uh, were really really nice guys. Um, I I'll just say this guy's name because he's he's well known for um, that this kind of happened to him. Uh, did Did you know who uh, Michael Brandon is? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was actually he was the co-owner of uh, Raging Stallion, the studio that. Oh. Um, yeah, and I didn't he. Know that. And and when I started working for the company, um, it like he he had to be um, excused by the other owner. Like the first, I think the first dinner I went to that was before I started in porn. Um. um uh, he, he had to be excused. Um, so we had dinner, and at the first dinner, he, he was there, and it was great. And then from that on, he had to be excused because he wasn't doing well, uh, and that was pretty sad. I just have to, I just have to Google if I'm talking about the right guy. That's why uh, my mind uh, was just jumping at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I want to verify too because that would be strange if we were talking about a different person. But I mean, this guy was very famous; like he was a very big actor. Um, and uh, there's kind of a double entendre when I say big; he was particularly well endowed. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is so unusual for people in adult film, from what I understand. <laughs> no, this guy was like crazy, like twelve inch, like. <laughs> No, we are talking about the same. We are talking about the same guy, and he he was he was a really really nice guy. And the yeah. thing is, and and the thing is that um, he his the other owners of the same company they were 
um, they were so caring towards him and um, they would tell me, yeah, he's not doing very well. And that you could really tell that the fact that he wasn't doing well personally really took, uh, took a toll on them because they were friends. And that was kind of how I was introduced into the porn industry, um, which was on the one side, a, a really bad thing because I saw how bad the drug problem can be, but it all was also very, very beautiful because I saw, saw how much they cared for each other um, uh -huh. in the best case scenario. Yeah, yeah, it, um, it's, it's a strange, so just so you know, um, I lived in San Francisco for seven years and not only did I live in San Francisco, I mean, did you spend time in San Francisco? I assume you must have. Oh, only for work, so I was only yeah. there for, for a week at a time. So I imagine you you know where the kink.com studios are? Yeah. The, the armory. Yeah, I lived w like on that same block as the Arco that's across the street from that. Mm -hmm. That's where I lived for, for seven years. So I knew, you know, thousands of gay guys. And um, when, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of say it, like when Michael Brandon would kind of go off the the grid for like a week and no one would have heard from him yeah. uh it would be like people posting on facebook if anyone's seen him you know blah 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 and then that was a, a well-known thing it's not like it's, it was a secret wow. because he, yeah i so, i feel like i have to be the dummy raising my hand is there something that like happened to this guy that i don't know about because we're there's a lot of past tense going on here well oh, oh, i i don't as well past tense because i'm for me, past tense because I'm not in the porn industry anymore. Um, and past tense for the company, I think he, at the end, he, at one point, he wasn't part of the company anymore simply because he became too much of a liability. Ah, I see. Yeah, I think it might be one of these things where people were trying to have a professional relationship for a long time because he was this very famous actor for a long time and he had established this successful business cool. and but then his drug problems um and his reckless because it wasn't just you know drug problems but it was like people having to hunt for him for weeks and not knowing what if he had died or something and then he'd show up and i don't know go to rehab or something and um but, but I, I i have to i have to say so um I have no idea what happened to him after a certain time, and uh, it's it's quite possible that he's living a very happy and very normal life. That he got his uh, stuff together. I I can only say I hope he he's doing well because he as the way I met him, he was a really nice guy and he was just really troubled. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, that's sort of what I am going to say. Like. Um, it it seems like there was a period when it was a part of his work like like it became public that everybody was sort of involved in his business and then maybe it got to the point where it was like okay well he gave up his position and now let's just hope that his close close personal friends and his family take care of him because that's all we can do and then i don't i've never heard of what's gone on with him since then and uh i guess neither have you so let's just hope that he's doing all right yeah uh, but i have to say i lost i lost two of my scene partners in the same year um one of them due to drugs the other one um he committed suicide because his partner committed suicide oh and then God. in the same year it was two other actors that also uh, died and it's it's really shocking on YouTube. There is a video of gay porn stars, uh, gay porn star deaths, and it's a really long video of just images, and it gives you the name. Uh, I think the year they yeah the name the year they died and the official reason why they died, and it's quite interesting because um, in the seventies eighties it's like. Um, AIDS, 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 suicide, AIDS, 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 um, heart attack, AIDS, AIDS, AIDS. And then at one point, um, it's getting less and less because um, AIDS was not as um, deadly as it used to be. And then it's just, um, it's dominated by heart attack and suicide. And heart attack, obviously, uh, is a euphemism for uh, drug abuse, I would say. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's Dr- really drug and steroid. Drug and steroid abuse. Uh, I have a question about yep. the gay porn industry. One hears all the time, but one rarely has the opportunity to ask anyone with any actual knowledge. Um, it's said that the majority of famous gay porn stars are actually straight and that a lot of straight men go into gay porn because the money is better. Is there That's, any basis to that? No, no, there's... That, I think I, I mean uh, go-go dancers. <laughs> oh, okay. I, yeah, yeah, I, I I'd, I'd heard about porn, but no, I'm sorry, please continue. Sorry. Um, I, I would say that amongst uh, go-go dancers, there's a little bit of truth to it. I think there are quite a few straight guys that do go-go dancing, um, but in the porn industry in America, I have to specify that in the American porn industry, the way I, uh, yeah, I experienced it, I would say that only maybe five mm, percent of the actors were were straight, um, and you would call that gay for pay. So uh, straight guys that do gay stuff for money. Sense. Um, mm. And some were bisexual, but even that was a real mi- min- a minority. Almost all the actors that I worked with were, um, as far as I know, exclusively gay. Mm-hmm. And even the ones that were straight or bisexual, the ones that I worked with in America, they had absolutely no problem in really enjoying sexuality with, mm-hmm. with guys. Um, it wasn't. It just wasn't their preference um, in as a relationship type. I would say. When you work in Eastern Europe, um, so I did a couple of scenes for a company in Hungary, which was horrible. It was a really, really bad experience. And they had predominantly straight guys working. Mm. That's it. Um, I'm trying to think. There's. I used to be really fond of this one. Hun- I think it's, in, I'm not sure if it's Hungarian, Bellamy. 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 Mm-hmm. I don't know where they are based, but yeah, I know of them. I, I, I have, when I was, uh, when I was in my uh, teens, like when I was 13, I was in love with, I'm probably going to say his name wrong, Johan Pollock. Um, okay. Yeah. Is, that, <laughs> um, is, that, is he related to uh, Jason Pollock? Uh, no, 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 I'm pretty, I don't think so. But <laughs> but it, I think that's uh, an interest, in, I don't think we've had an opportunity to talk about it yet. But uh, aside from, you know, some of the more interest, well, not more, but some of the interesting history you've had, uh, your other body of work, your art, is quite mm-hmm. amazing. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. No, not at all. Um, I'm not exactly a... I'm more educated in film than I am in art, per se. I know enough not to be a complete idiot. But um, So you're going to have to forgive me for a second or tell me if it does. But um, when well, I see your I art... Don't know. I don't know anything about art, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly know a lot about making it. Yeah. Um, it reminds me a lot of um, Munch, actually. Uh, is, I believe that's how you say it. The Scream? Yeah, yeah. Um, f- fun fact, and I'm not 100% sure that's just something I heard about the painting, uh, uh, The Scream. I heard that the painting is actually called the screaming and it's Mm. not the person screaming. The person is actually covering its ears uh, in agony because the environment around him or her is screaming. Oh, it doesn't, doesn't change that the painting completely. That no. is such an interesting, it's such an interesting fact, but I'm not hundred percent sure. It, 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 it does nice. make sense. I think I have like a blow up, um, like balloon, like plastic of, of that little guy. Like you can, um, it, it's about like two and a half feet high and you blow it up. But I don't it's, know where, where it is. They used to sell those a lot. They even showed up on the nanny one time. Right. Uh, that's kind of interesting. It It's sort of like, um, you tell, when you say that, it's sort of like watching um, movies that have a twist the second time. Like when you watch Fight yeah. Club or The Matrix, knowing the twist. So it's like... Then you see it completely differently, yeah. Very much so, and it almost. By, by the way, I, I would say I would say I'm, I know more about movies uh, and the film industry than I know about uh, art. That's for sure. <laughs> well, well so I, wanna, I wanted to just ask you real quick um, um, about your art. It, for for the people in the audience who haven't looked at it, um, actually, if um, 
Uh, you can could put it in the um, put the uh, link to his gallery in the uh, chat. That would be if you could. That'd be awesome. Um, it looks to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, that you uh, work with found objects, and then you draw perhaps with uh, chalk or uh, something on them. Am I right in that? Yeah. So I, as I said, I live here in the far north, north of Scotland and I when I walk around in the landscape uh, but it, it would be the same if I was living in the city if I find rusty pieces of metal or uh, interesting pieces of plastic but they have to be old and weathered then I would pick them up take them home and if the shape of the material or patterns in the material inspire me then I try to to enhance what's already there so if there are patterns in the rust i just add a little bit to the patterns to create proper paintings so if i see um, the silhouette of a person or the shape of a face then i uh, i enhance the eyes and the mouth and stuff like that so that's how i create uh paintings and i would say my big biggest inspirations are uh are I would say the work of Tim Burton, then, yeah, yeah Tim Burton, Hieronymus Bosch, he's a Dutch uh, painter from uh, from medieval times. Um, I'm inspired by church paintings, like old church paintings. Um, Dali, uh, the, there is an American progressive metal band called Tool. Um, uh -huh. There are, there yeah, are yeah. inspirations. Like, not, I wouldn't say that tool for example inspired me and i wouldn't say that hieronymus bosch and the other artists that they, they necessarily completely inspired me but we have a similar source of inspiration um the beauty in the grotesque and i would say that i play with the attraction of um of age and and the fact that we are dying and there is an aspect of suffering in my paintings as well but not not always it's interesting that you say that because i can see a bit of the tim burton influence but when i saw your art at least on the link that prince provided us with, which which by the way bacon can we can we put a link can we screen share his uh art on the screen if that's i, what you I do? don't know where the link is it's in the Twitter. Um, I, I can send it to you. Yeah, you're gonna have to send it to me again. It's also just philiptanser.com, so it's relatively easy. Uh, but um, I, was, would double, yeah. I was gonna say, like, um, I didn't. It's funny because there's so much warmth and like just uh, organic beauty in the art oh, yeah. that oh, I, yeah. I I never saw anything grotesque in it. To me, it looked like kind of like I could see the age and the um, you know, again, like I said, the organic texture is a sort of very natural flow, but it's it's warm and progressive almost. And when I say progressive, I mean like you can sort of see movement and um, a sense of place and history and future. When when I when I say grotesque, um, I have to put that into perspective because it's not grotesque for me. But I, as I said, I live in the far north of Scotland and we have a lot of uh, British uh, people driving around here and coming to my gallery and to them it's it's very modern art and they like landscape paintings and stuff like that and they have not been socialized with um, art influences of people like Burton Toro is also one of the influences I would say um, I think that we grew up with a certain imagery that precedes a grotesque. It's grotesque for older people. Things. Yeah. Is anyone else getting roboting, or is that just me? No, I think that he is cutting out. Okay. In, in and out. Um. Did Uh -oh. um, we seem to be having technical difficulties. And ha, it's not OBS for once. I'm sure OBS is involved somehow. Yeah, I'm, we actually might use it next week. I think I've unfucked it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really not confident. 
Not in you, can but you in Obi. Can you hear me? Okay, now, yeah, we, now can we can hear you. Hear you. Yeah. UK skin just uh, said that Scotland okay. has potato <laughs> internet. <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> um, I, what was the last thing you heard that I said? Um, you started to talk about how they hadn't been in, uh, basically enculturated. Um, oh, by the way, Bacon, I put his art in the in the uh, chat. Um, okay, here we go. But yeah, like you you had said that um, your art was something that like a lot of the British and the locals they hadn't really seen before, um, and to them it's very modern and new. And oh, we can see it on the screen now. Lovely. Did we lose? Oh, he's gone altogether. Oh, uh, he will hopefully come back. <laughs> I hope so. But yeah, I know. Well, Scotland well, it, and its potato internet. At least it's mm, not Canada. Mm -hmm. Now his art, though, is anything mm -hmm. but potato. I mean, I would put this in my home if mm -hmm. I had money and space. <laughs> but um, yeah, I love this. I really, really Ooh. do. It's. Because a lot of modern art is just so pretentious. It's especially these days with so much as a prince. I'm sure you know better than I do. I'm sure you have many stories about pretentious modern art. Oh, I mean, well, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can basically put a disassembled IKEA table on the floor and call it modern art. Well, at least that would involve actually doing something. I was more talking about like whoever that artist was who took a toilet <laughs> and put it in. Uh, the Museum Monar, and it's literally just a toilet. He didn't make it, he didn't do anything to it, like, it's just a toilet. And I don't care how brilliant your adjective descriptions are, how much context you're trying to give it, like, it's still a toilet. Yeah, 75% of art is the bullshit reasoning behind why it, it exists. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the people, I like to call those people, like, they're, they're, um, because, see, those people, they aren't, like, usually even selling it, these are people who like get grants to like make their art and then like end up in like weird pretentious museums somehow magically. And I, I, I like to say that they're really just bullshit artists and their, their, their main skill is writing out a grant and like justifying why they did something. Yeah. They're, they, it's uh, kind of like the most hipster welfare there is like before Patreon <laughs> there were, there was grant money. Yeah. And you, and you, we, we've all gone through the whole toxic charity bullshit. Oh, yes, we have. And he's yes. back. Yay. We were just talking about how much we love your artwork, except your internet, which we don't love. I'm back. Oh, God, it's a disco. <laughs> I, oh, you're kind of actually not back entirely. Maybe yet. you should... Maybe it'd be better if he turned off his camera is uh, just so we get used to it. Maybe. Video. I think that there's also the connection thing. Like, you go to, um, like, how do you uh, um, I think you can like limit the bandwidth. Um, oh yes, actually you can. That is um, where do you do that? You do that on the the little bar oh, thingy. Yeah. Um, if you, our, my friend, if you can hear us, either tr try turning off your camera or hitting the it that little. It you see like the next to the cog. There's the bandwidth usage. If you click on that, it'll allow you to adjust it. I turned off the camera. Oh, and now we can hear. I don't know how to do that. The camera. Can you hear me? Can you? Now you're, you're back. Your camera's back on again. But we could hear you. Okay, there you are. Oh. Yeah, you should just keep it okay. like that, or um, you should you should probably just keep it with your avatar because then we'll we'll probably be more likely to be able to hear you. If, so let's just try it like that for a while. Hello. I, I okay. Uh, I'll turn up the. I'll, tu I'll turn up the camera. Okay. Um. And 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 if not, you yeah. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Hello? You, can, you can also. You can try to adjust can bandwidth. You? you can adjust bandwidth usage. Um. Uh. Next to the uh, camera icon, there's the the bars. Like it, it looks like the reception bars. And you can change how much bandwidth is being used, and you can slow the. Um, it'll make it so that you're not using as much data as at once. But leave the camera off because your your internet doesn't like you. Okay, uh, but the problem is every time I turn the camera off, uh, it seems like you guys couldn't under, couldn't hear me anymore. Oh well, now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, and I, I, I put the bandwidth down, so. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Okay, well, it's, hopefully it'll it'll stay working. Um, and by the way, cats, um, I uh, want you to write this guy a message. This I'm, I'm I'm locked out of my Facebook, and this friend of mine is visiting, and he wants to hang out, but I can't write him a message. So um, remind me to um, make you send him a message. Oh, okay. So. It wouldn't be the gay triarchy if we weren't experiencing some form of technical difficulty. Yeah. Oh, it's it's feminism, right? They are attacking us. Uh, you know what? It, probably they used gender quotas to make sure that the Scottish IT company has gender parity, and thus the internet connection is suffering. <laughs> so, uh, unless your internet server is actually a potato, in which case I I feel for you. <laughs> so we were on a very interesting subject, and then you um. Uh, change the subject to his art, which is cool. It's an interesting subject. I encourage everybody to go check out his art. Um, but what we tend to talk about is more of the men's rights um, and feminism type stuff. Uh, so you just sort of mentioned that, and I think it would be a good segue to go back. Um, you were talking about deaths of um, porn actors. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the things that is a, a staple of discourse, like that, that we talk about, and we are some of the only people that talk about this, is that there is a massive crisis within the um, homosexual male population going on right now, where um, there is a huge meth crisis, and due to okay. prep, everybody is barebacking. And, um, Such you a know, bad idea. yeah, it's like, okay, you know, maybe they aren't all going to get AIDS though. Um, just for the record, uh, there's been at least four cases of guys who have contracted HIV while on prep and it's only been out for four years. So that's actually not the greatest. Oh, I did. I didn't even hear that. They, they, okay. That that happened, but okay, cool. Well, yeah. not cool. No, but yeah, it's it's and and um so there's all these guys who are starting to uh you know contract HIV. Um but even if you don't contract HIV, there's a lot of other things to worry about if you're going around having meth sex without condoms constantly. Like is that's not the best thing. It's not the best idea. You know, but but all sorts of guys are thinking it's okay. And there seems to be zero support. Like there seems to be zero resources for like, unless you actually already have HIV and you can walk into some place and they're going to give you counseling and they're going to give you free health care and all this stuff, um, there's no support for guys. They don't give a crap about us with uh, LGBT charities and everything. In fact, it's, it's almost the reverse. They're telling us that we have male privilege or white privilege and that we're all racist because we put, you know, like, because guys put stuff on their grinder. They say, like, no fats, no femmes, no Asians, and that's the worst thing in the world. Therefore, uh, fuck all these guys. Their issues aren't actually real. And I think that that's a really, really dangerous thing. Like, it's like, why is it? Why isn't there? Um, why isn't there? Uh, uh, the, the 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 nonprofit and the support that's supposedly to be for gay men is actively not serving us. And I just wonder why. Can I can I be um, a conservative, boring, critical person? <laughs> yeah. uh, so how how anti LGBTQ community can I be on this broadcast? We are the we are the parents. <laughs> Prince and I are the parents of Gigtow gays going their own way. Um, so I like uh, yeah. I like that. So so. Um, I think that um, so twenty roughly twenty years ago, I was German Mister Leather, so I was the official representative of the German uh, leather and fetish community, and I was working. Um, I was handing out condoms at a lot of um, party sex parties and stuff like that, and I was very very active. And in the beginning, um, the the HIV support, uh, not support groups, but like the government HIV support, um, they they put up posters saying, protect yourself, uh, don't catch HIV, uh, you don't want to die, pretty much, blah, blah, blah. And then after a couple of years, the narrative completely changed. 
and it said, um, "Hey, it's not it's not that bad having HIV, and you can still be a normal person." And um, don't and it was literally the whole agenda changed uh, towards making people uh, not be afraid of people with HIV and. I said, well, how, why should people still protect themselves if they think that it's not that bad having HIV? And I think now we are at a stage where this is like at, at its peak, where nobody really protects themselves anymore. Um, but as you said, you cannot just get HIV. You can get all these other STDs. And um, I, I, I'm very lucky because, first of all, I always protected myself. And uh, secondly, I was never really into anonymous sex. I did go to a lot of sex clubs and sex parties because I really enjoyed um, watching humans interact. And I liked the weirdness of these places. But yeah, because that's, why, that's why I went to them, too. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but I, because I feel like Jane Goodall with the gorillas when I go to Steamworks. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> But because and I'm the but innocent one that never goes. <laughs> but because I but because I was never really into having sex with people, uh, nothing really happened to me. And also, I've never taken drugs in my life. Um, but I felt like telling people, "Hey, stop taking drugs and stop being self-destructive." Um, and maybe you have. Uh, mental health issues and stuff like that. I, I felt like a party pooper. I felt like, oh, you can't say that to people. They're just having a good time. They're just enjoying themselves. No, they're actually actively destroying their, their own life. And it seems like because you have to be proud to be gay, you have to be happy to be gay, you can't question if the gay lifestyle the official, how, how it's being sold, the gay lifestyle, if that is just an unhealthy lifestyle and maybe we should um, copy a little bit more of straight lifestyle as in having committed relationships and not fucking around as much. It's, it's interesting because um, we've kind of gone completely even beyond the deprioritizing of gay issues where it's some of the people that are still involved are going the opposite way. Um, for instance, we have in California, you might have heard that they passed that law for reasons, I guess, uh, saying that it's no longer a, I believe it's, they said it's no a longer. misdemeanor now. Yeah, it's a misdemeanor to, to knowingly infect someone with mm -hmm. HIV or AIDS. And um, you, a you misdemeanor. Said, yeah. Wow. Yeah. They, they want to destigmatize it, they said. And then they have like these, like there was this restaurant somewhere, I think it was probably here in California, where they were not where they said they as part of trying to destigmatize HIV they made sh they wanted the entire staff to be positive cooks and all and like that was a selling point of the restaurant because like you know it was like pause visibility or something mm -hmm. and to me this kind of mentality is extremely dangerous um it's suicidal mhm mm i heard i come correct me if i'm wrong but when i was still doing porn in san francisco i heard from several people that it's actually cool to be hiv positive because you don't have to work and um, you're being taken care of and you saw all these gay guys just walking around during the day that didn't have to work and um people said well it, it's actually a lifestyle to aspire is there some truth to that or yes. was that yeah okay, wow. <laughs> I, I think yeah, i think yeah, it's yeah. i think um, it's less so now but no yeah. no no <laughs> okay. no it is totally popular now no i lived in san francisco oh. i went to those bars that the guys the bug chaser type guys go to um because i you know where i live philip mm -hmm. like or lived um yeah that's right in between the castro and soma which you know like soma uh that's where like the powerhouse um the hole in the wall the eagle and the lone star um and all of those bars are the type of places where very 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 a very high population of hiv positive men go to in particular the powerhouse the powerhouse is like you know like there the they all but advertise on the flyer. This is where you go if you want to have bareback sex with HIV-positive men. 
like mm -hmm. that, because that's what it is and i would go to the powerhouse very frequently because um i was friends with a number of the people who work there and um it was on the way to this bar that i actually liked to go to that was called aunt charlie's and so i could go in there get in for free sometimes get um a free drink or like there would be like two for one tickets that you would just kind of like get for this one night that i would get into for free anyway so i'd go like have two drinks and say hi to some people and then go to the bar that i actually like to go to and it's definitely this weird thing where like a new guy moves to town and he's young and he's cute and like uh um he starts hanging out with those guys and a lot of those guys are attractive it's not like they're not good looking but oh, yeah absolutely but they but they they don't fully they don't fully accept you if you're not hiv positive let me tell you like they 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 think of you as sort of like like one of the the squares like one of the like not cool people and then when the young, if one of these young guys um ends up uh having sex a lot and then gets hiv he is showered with attention and all of a sudden you see him like working doors or maybe he's like bar backing at a like he got a job out of it and like all of this weird stuff and and like some drag queen will take him under her wing and there's this 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 big culture of it and and they act like they're being supportive or anything but it's like i feel like they almost encourage it because it's not like other guys don't see that happen to him and start to become a little bit jealous and think oh if only i got it then that would happen to me and so it's definitely what something that still happens would you say that there is a like there is a connection of um, it's it it almost sounds like a different version of victimhood victim mentality yeah. where um, because we're all victim of the same issue we it's easier for us to bond and we create like a victim subculture. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it absolutely, absolutely is. Um, there's a by, by the way, I have, to, I have to point out, obviously, um, I have absolutely no problem with HIV positive people. Um, lots of my colleagues and some of my friends um, are and were HIV positive. And, um, but I have, to, I have to say, I really, really prefer people that say, hey, I'm HIV positive, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it but you better protect yourself and you better make sure that you don't catch it those are the people that i really respect so um i have because to, I, I, don't, I don't want the stigmatization of um hiv positive people but i think it's still incredibly important to point out that it is uh, something that you should try not to have <laughs> it, it is yeah, a disease yeah. or or, or yeah. something like you know if they were to say, I'm HIV positive, um, I should not live my life in shame. Um, it was, for me, contracting HIV was a mistake that happened in the past. Um, and I, it should not affect the way that people treat me and I should not walk around in shame for the rest of my life. However, there's very few sacrifices I would not make to make myself HIV negative. And yeah. if, if someone said that, that would be a lot more constructive than this, like, how dare you pause shame? How dare you shame guys for not wanting to use mm -hmm. condoms? How dare, you know, because that is how they act. They totally yeah, it, act it, like it, that. It's getting even worse. I mean, it's even to the point where there, these the people that are, like, shaming you are literally saying, you have no right to know if the person you're having sex with even has an STD. And I'm like, bitch, whatever happened to my body, my choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that went away. Yeah, yeah, I know that that basically went away like the common cold, but for the like, God. There, I, as much as as much as I completely and utterly um, reject this mentality, particularly uh, Philip, you, you don't you probably don't know this. So I'm a nurse in real life, so this this kind of thing is just beyond bizarre to me. But there is one weird little thing though that I do have to point out about this, but. There in California, particularly the Bay Area, everything is very expensive, and there is one tangible benefit to getting HIV. And this, for anyone who's listening, is not me saying do it. It's I don't think it's worth it at all. But big but, if you get HIV, that you will be allowed to get Medi-Cal, government health insurance. Which in America, <laughs> I mean, without going down that you know well no there's a there's a number of no there's a number of tangible notable 
privileges. Like you can also mm -hmm. get disabilities. And so, you know, there's, 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 there's the free health care. There mm -hmm. is the, um, you, you know, get social public, security. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Social security, but that's, you know, that's money. It's free money. Um, and then there, the, so, so there's these um, circumstantial comp, um, compensatory uh, privileges that you do get when once you become HIV positive um, that come from the government, and then you have to keep into you have to keep in mind that Katz brought up earlier um, the fact that they um, made knowingly transmitting HIV uh, it used to be a felony and now it's a misdemeanor. Well, the same exact guy who fought for that to be the case, he is a um, senator or congressional representative named Scott Weiner. Um, Scott Weiner, who lives in San Francisco, and by the way, sends messages to my friends on Grinder. Just so you know, just so you know. To who? So, um, just, Senator Scott Weiner, that kind. Yeah, yeah. He he sent he 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 goes on Grinder and sends sends messages to my friends, and they show me. They're like, "Ew, God, Scott just, Weiner just sent me a message." But um, well, well, he's. I I I would say that everybody, even politicians, have a right to a uh, personal sex life. So I think yeah, it's, yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. That's, yeah. No, that, I'm just being catty. I'm just being mm -hmm. catty. Um, but the, the the point he's he's he, if you see photos of this guy, um, there's hold on, coming up. There's something sleazy <laughs> about him. Like there's something very. Um, yeah, I, I, he just give me, he gives me the willies. So um, the thing I, about are you, are, you, are you actually creep shaming? Yes. <laughs> yes, I absolutely am. <laughs> so um, the thing is, is that he came, He was the one who fought for knowingly transmitting HIV from a felony to a misdemeanor, and he is also the same exact guy. Here he is. He's he's also the same exact guy who w was the biggest proponent of prep being given to guys for free as part of um, medical coverage. Like he was really really big on campaigning for prep to be popular, and he re he, he came out and wrote an article for the Huffington Post saying that he was on on prep it's himself and that it was 99% effective blah 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 like right as soon as it came out um and now 4 years later well there's been four people that we know of for sure that have contracted HIV while on prep and the center for disease control lists it at about 92% effective not wow. nine, not 99% effective. So well, well at least uh, at least we get a free study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but I just think that all of that is very very interesting because um all of this stuff is being pushed by the Democrats and even specific Democrats and they're the Democrats offer the social services and the health care, you know, like they're the party of doing that stuff. And so you take all these things together, it almost looks like you know if i was a conspiracy theorist which i'm obviously not it does almost look like the democrats have something to gain by yeah. having a population of guys who are dependent upon their health care and they are hoping that we get it and well well that sounds very much like the dependence on uh single mothers mm -hmm. and on uh poor um Poor minorities. Mm -hmm. it, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. So hmm. that's I, I. I really don't understand how certain certain kinds of like actually empowering people turned so quickly into uh, self victimizing people. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. And and they and they and they they get really really um. Uh, if they, they, there's nothing that um, these types of people hate more, like there's nothing that feminists hate more than a legitimately strong woman that's not a feminist. Oh yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I, I would even argue to say that feminists hate nothing more than another strong feminist that actually disagrees with them because there are still some feminists 
and you i mean you can support or um feminism or be against feminism but there are some old school feminists that say sorry but back in the days when i was 20 um feminism was all about empowering women and pretty much teaching women to if if they are being pushed around by a guy to just say to push back and to say fuck you um and now it's all about this uh, victim mentality so i actually have a lot of like admiration for these old school feminists uh that say hey uh if women want certain rights or if we women want to be equal they have to step up their game well you also yeah. got to take into consideration most modern feminists are are the bedroom feminists they're the oh i'm middle class and white and ooh, when's this man going to come and help me because i can't do anything it, I, I hate to slander them, but they kind of are. They are all that. They're just the middle class. I'm I'm rich and I've never had anything hard in my life. I I think that the the, the, the mentality I I describe it as um the current incarnation. You know, mm -hmm. feminists raised in the 1980s beyond. You know, like I was born in '82, mm -hmm. so all the girls my age and um and younger their attitude is almost exclusively that of the lifelong teacher's pet. They mm -hmm. got by in life by sucking up to the authorities and by, by, by playing along with the nice, innocent, good girl routine. And as long as they did that, they didn't really have to work very hard in school. They just got, it was easy to get by, even in college, because I remember this very specifically in college, there were girls that, they they acted really shy and quiet and they never raised their hands to talk and they weren't good writers i remember because i would i would peer review their tape their their papers but the teachers would be easy on them in grades and they ended up graduating um just because everybody kind of favored nice innocent good girls and oh, yeah, i absolutely. I'm, I'm i'm positive that that that's the same case with employers like they're never going to be the favorite employee because they don't really work all that hard and they're not really, but they can still get jobs. And then they're not going to fire the nice, innocent, good girl, even if she's completely non-productive. And I, I, have, I have, I have to say it, it really bothers me that, um, I think, I think women, and this is not a rant against women, but I think women get away with a lot because they are, nice and they don't come across as harmful and for example in the last couple of days i was in a lot of like chats which were about child abuse and stuff like that and um they i think women are really really good at picking their fights and always just supporting the obvious victim and always playing the nice person and by playing the nice person they never actually have to stand up for something that is worth standing up for and so they kind of slide through life very easily no oh, oh, wait i'm the only one here or the only one not muted i don't know i kind of i agree i just agree i don't have anything to add to that <laughs> Sorry, sorry. I was um, grabbing water. I had the speakers on, so I could hear. I was just grabbing myself a cup of water. Um, no, you're you're absolutely right, um, Philip. And the thing about um, those women, like if if the women slide through life and they never have to take a stand or anything, they also never have to stand up for themselves, mm -hmm. and that does them a disservice because they're never put in a position where they're forced to be ruthlessly competitive, and. Um, you know, there's also a lot of gay guys who kind of end up like that too, to a certain degree. Like there's, there's, there's gay guys who only ever hang out with gay guys and girls. They never, ever really hang out with straight guys. They never have to compete with straight guys. And like, I, I don't know if you ever listened to electronic music very much, but I used to be a drum and bass DJ in the late night. Yeah, I was a drum, drum and bass DJ in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I was the only gay drum and bass DJ that anyone ever knew. And yeah. it, it was very, very competitive and very cutthroat competitive. Like if you were either good or you weren't. And, you know, no one no one was going to tell me that, that I was... Everybody just suspected me to be bad because I was gay. And they're like, w w who's this gay guy thinking that, you know? And so I learned that I had to compete. And then... But 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 and the in, thing, the thing in was the gay, in the gay scene, it's it's enough to be gay 
to be accepted. It's the same in the gay art scene. That's why I, I really don't like the gay art scene because you only have to be gay and paint penises and all of a sudden all gay guys like you. Or, yeah, and attractive and willing to suck the right penis. Um, <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the, 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 I didn't do so well in the uh, gay DJ scene because I uh, didn't, uh, didn't put out to the, the, the right guys. Um, but, you know, what, what I did learn in the straight scene was that, yes, they were very, very harsh. And sure, they did underestimate me. But when I proved myself, they respected me. They, Absolutely. And, and I actually really appreciated that. But I think that a lot of women and even gay guys, they're never, they never put themselves in a position where they decide to go ahead and compete with the straight guys. And, and um, maybe because they're scared, maybe because, because it's never occurred to them that they could, maybe because they're just not talented enough to do it because straight guys are, re <laughs> straight guys are really good at stuff. Because straight guys don't have anything to, like nobody cares about them unless they prove that they are worth being cared about. And uh, I, I tell you one thing. So I was in the German military for three years, even though I'm a total pacifist. Um, and I went to the military because I wanted to see if I would survive the experience. And when I entered the military, back in the days, I looked like a mix between uh, Prince and Marilyn Manson. So I was wait, visually- Wait, wait, can, can, I, can I just, because I was almost finished with this talk. So, and I want to, I'll, I'll remember the, the military um, story. Because I was just yeah. wanting to finish up about these, these people who make themselves into victims. Um, yeah. The, the thing is, is that if people have never forced themselves to compete and to, to like, it's, it's, it's gratifying to not be a victim. It's gratifying to realize that like, wait, these people that, you know, are mean and competitive and uh, I can beat them, you know, like if, if totally. they, if they, if they challenge me, I can show, I can shut them down. And then, then you have a, you know, like that's what Camille Paglia would do. If, if, if somebody tried to, to um, you know, you talk about these old feminists that are yep. um, strong. If somebody tried to call Camille Paglia an idiot, she would she would make fun of them and make everyone laugh at the, at that person, and 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 she would she would prove herself, and that's what she that's her her style of female empowerment. Um, that well, That's these, the thing. You can't. You can't. Uh, I think Jordan Peterson at one point he said, um, "You, I, I don't want to um, misphrase Jordan Peterson, but if I uh, remember uh, remember correctly, he said something like, "Well, you can't demand respect. You have to earn respect." It's exactly. Just, it doesn't fall out of the sky. And why yeah. would somebody respect you just because you have a vagina? Or why would somebody respect you just because um, you are you can suck penis as a man? Yeah. Um, so, you so, still have to so bring something. Yeah. So when these girls are put into a situation where finally they are they've been giving every advance um every advantage in life like every 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 help you know every bit of help uh uh from teachers maybe even affirmative action quotas at university they were you know and um and then finally they're put in a situation where they, where they are treated as an equal mm -hmm. then they feel like a victim because it's never happened to them and that's why it's so appealing to them. That's 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 the thought. Do you mean you're holding me to a standard? How dare you? That's so misogynist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to um, tell you the story about me being in the military yeah, real quick. Yeah. Um, so, I so I joined the military. I looked like a mix between uh, Marilyn Manson and Prince. and But obviously during the day I had to wear the uniform. And... But I, I said, even though I'm against the military, I will put in as much effort as I can and I will try to be as good of a soldier as possible. And after a couple of weeks, I was being made a trainer for young recruits because and, and, I, and I, I told my um, superior, my lieutenant, I was like, well, you know that I'm a pacifist and that I'm against the army. And he, he was like, well, you don't. You sh as a German soldier, you should be a pacifist because we fight for peace. And it, I don't care that you're against the army as long as you don't tell it to the recruits. Uh, recruits, You don't have to say that you like it. Just don't say that you dislike it. And they knew that I was gay. I And 
for most of them, I was the first gay person that they've uh, they had ever met, and nobody had any problems with me with me because I was working really really hard, and I got the utmost respect from everybody. I got um, like um, yeah, everybody in the whole military compound knew me and really really appreciated me, and it hasn't changed since. But there was another gay guy who who joined and he behaved like a drama queen and he was self victimizing and people really didn't like him. And he obviously said it was homophobia, but it wasn't. Um, it was just because he self victimized. Yeah. I think that that's a, that, that is a common um, thing that happens. And it's, it's, it's hard to know the difference because it becomes a, a sort of a feedback loop or like a vicious circle when, um, some, some like let's just so let's say like a gay guy or maybe even a woman. Um, one of these people is annoying, like they're just really fucking annoying in in either a uh, total drama queen gay guy way or just like a annoying bitch kind of way. And people are just like, uh, oh, what the fuck? And so, um, like, and and let's say it's the only woman or gay guy around, and so the straight guys are going to be like, oh, that fucking faggot, dude, or they're going to say, oh, that fucking bitch, like what the yeah, fuck. Yeah. And, and then they hear that and they're like, see, they called me a faggot. And it's like, well, not, okay. They were just because insulting you because you're an asshole. Not because it doesn't, you know. It's if, not a gay were, thing. It's a. If you, were, if, you weren't, if you weren't gay, you were fat. But the same person, then they just would just use fatty against you because it's the yeah. most convenient thing. Yeah, but then, but then you, but then you say you complain about, oh, well, he called me a faggot. And they must be homophobic. And then the straight guy gets no. defense, and then the straight guy gets really defensive. And it's like, no, I don't hate you because you're gay. I hate you because you're annoying. You fucking, okay. f fucking faggot. Why do gay guys always? Why do gay guys always pull this shit where they think it's about their sexuality? No, I just don't like you. And then, okay. and then, and then the conflict gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's hard to know anymore. Uh, because because the, the gay guy is always going to think that it all started because of homophobia. And then at, at a certain point, it does develop into homophobia, where the straight guy is like, Jesus, if I ever have to fucking work with a gay guy again, I'm going to quit. Exactly. <laughs> so. it, and it's, it's, the sa it's the same with women. Um, if, if, if you have to deal with women and women always behave in a certain way, you start to become you start to hate certain female traits and behaviors and then people call you misogynistic and you're like, sorry, but these behaviors are really irritating. It's the same with, uh, with guys. I mean, there are certain behaviors that are quite prevalent amongst men that can be irritating. And, um, and I think you should be allowed to point these things out. That doesn't make you uh, misandristic or misogynistic. It just means that you don't like bullshit. Yeah. I think one of the issues that we run into with this is something we've kind of talked Wait, about. I just want to say something real quick. By the way, if you are um, tuning and you have not hit the like button, please do, because I think this is a good conversation and I would like some more people to be liking it or watching it. So like, hit the like button, please do. Okay, sorry. Okay. Keep going. I was going to say, we, we've talked about this in kind of gig tao type terms before where there are kind of, you know, there's many different types. So let's just say there are two different types of gay men. I feel like there are gay there are men who are gay and then there are gay men I, correct yeah like and i think that a lot of the gay men the men that make their sexuality and their whole you know struggle their like form of victimhood make it their whole identity i think that those are the kind of gays that have been around feminists too long because they've absorbed that victim mentality and it's something that prince and all of us have talked about um, which is uh, probably something to do with the AIDS crisis, where there was genuine between the the AIDS crisis and you know the the Stonewall riots. There was a time of genuine victimhood. Wait, but but, but I know every fucking time. I'm sorry. Every time this comes up, this di this supposed dichotomy between gay uh, men who happen to be gay and then guys who have a, a high amount of 
their personal identity based around being gay. Every time we talk about that, I always have to point out that there are, I think, three distinct types. So there's there's mm -hmm. guys that just happen to be gay who are men. And then there's guys who who do have a big part of their identity uh, around being gay, but there's two different types. There's the activist victim type people who hang out with feminists and stuff. And then there's the uh, the Oscar Wildes and the uh, Andy Warhols and the Tennessee Williams of the world. You know, these these great gay artists who you you, you think of as uh, you, the people who are, um, you know, like the, what's that, um, the Chanel designer, um, Karl Lagerfeld. Like, it's like, these these guys aren't victims. They're actually very, very powerful. And they're, and they're very yeah, talented. Well, but I would well, I would argue that they are gay elitists. Yes, they are, and that's that's that is something that I yeah. always say when when I talk about these these. So these guys, they, they and, oh. and there's there's maybe fewer of them these days, mm -hmm. but they are very elitist. Is, um, but even yeah. when you talk about these guys who are you know super gay, I what I mean is like when you talk to say the guy who started Chanel, I don't think that the fact that he was super gay would be his most definitive personality as part. In fact, it probably would be the last thing he would talk about because he's I don't know. Person. Have you ever fucking seen pictures of that guy? I, I no, I don't. But what I mean is like <laughs> I, I I know that there are plenty of, you know, you know, Uber queens who are, you know, incredible titans of industry and you know they're incredible people and i'm not trying to say that they've simplified themselves because they're so gay i don't mean flamboyant i'm not talking about like you know flamboyant feminist feminized you know men i'm not saying there's masculine and feminine what i mean is there are there are gay men who are you know they're gay men but that's not necessarily the first thing they'll tell you they have they other meet... stuff to talk about yes they're not <laughs> defined exclusively by their by their sexuality yeah because like, exactly. yeah, so like... it's, part, it's part of their personality it's not their personality yes yeah like i i would be sort of a little bit of that on youtube like it's like you know i'm a part of the the the, the um men's rights movement but i'm also part of the the grander skeptic sphere so i know a lot of the uh you know bigger channels like you know i um i'm personal quote unquote kind of friends with people like bearing undoomed you know like um and jeff holiday like i've all been in streams with numerous times and um like those guys you would never just think of as hanging out with gay guys. Um, and so people would be like, oh, you're just some random stereotypical gay guy. Like, like people have used that as like a way to um, insult me when there's been YouTube drama. And it's like, well, no fucking shit. My name is Prince of Queens. You know, like I, I'm not trying to just fit in as one of the straight guys. Like that was never in part. But at the same time, the straight guys are happy to hang out with me because I have other shit to say. Mm -hmm. And and the same thing I would say to when anyone uses like that kind, which I consider to be a very low blow. Like, I mean, at that point, that's, I think, of when a person really just hasn't thought of anything better to put you down with. Because, like, you wouldn't just say, like, oh, you're just a girl or you're just a black guy or, you know, but it is something that's acceptable to tell to a gay guy. Or it, well, was, or it, it was it was last decade and they hope it still is. Yeah, mm -hmm. seriously. Um, I, I I would like to, if that's okay for you guys, I would like to uh, di redirect the conversation a little bit Please towards do. the um, uh, the men's rights movement. Yeah. So yeah. A couple, couple of weeks ago, I was at the uh, international um, conference for men's issues in London, which is, even though it's really small, it's the biggest. Um, convention for men's rights and there was a scholar he's an american but he lives in the uk and he's i think the most quoted squ uh, scholar on masculinity at the moment and his name is dr eric anderson are you guys familiar with him he sounds familiar yes. yeah yeah um <clears throat> i think i was actually talking to um one of the honey badgers about him we talked to um, allison about it a couple weeks ago yeah yeah okay so yeah, we talked but, to her on air i wasn't sure if i talked to her about it in private or not i forget Okay. So, so um, he had this talk, and Dr. Anderson, he's gay. He's married and has two uh, two sons. Um, and I, his his talk about masculinity really really freaked me out because um, he was talking to a whole like 
group like all the mras and he was talking about masculinity and that and he called his talk uh, masculinity from a non-feminist point of view and i would argue that it was still a feminist induced point of view but it was more definitely uh, masculinity from a gay point of view and the whole agenda that he was talking about was literally um men are only good men if they are not too masculine because if men are too masculine then they tend to be homophobic and we don't like homophobic men and it it was really bizarre and i actually i was sitting on a table with him later on and i asked him um do you do you actually think that you can be a scholar on mas or the main scholar on masculinity take uh, given that you are gay so you can't really understand 95 or more percent of men because you've never been in a relationship with a woman and he said well everybody seems to agree that i can be the leading scholar in masculinity and it really freaked me out. <laughs> everybody, everybody, everybody. Everyone, everyone in my everybody. sociology department. I, I, think, I, think he, I think he meant everyone that matters. Yeah. To him. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> keep, sorry, keep going. I just had to like throw up in my mouth a little bit. My no, institution no, 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 review no, no, board no, agrees no. with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, it really freaked me out because there doesn't seem to be a single like real scholar on masculinity who is actually a self-identifying man who is okay with being man and who who doesn't want to fight his own inner masculinity. Well, there's Warren Farrell. Yeah, yeah, but to be honest, even Warren Farrell, he is a very soft person. He used to be a feminist, and I have I, I really like him, uh -huh. but he is a soft intellectual. Um, I would argue that at the moment the the main guy who speaks for normal man is Jordan Peterson. Uh huh. Yeah. I'd say so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see what you're saying. Um, I mean, guys, he certainly resonates with people a whole whole lot. Um, I, I I so because because I lived completely gay till I was 32, and then I changed. Well, I didn't change sides, but I started dating women again. So I I know both sides to of the picture, and I have to say that um, identifying as a man, as a like being a gay man and being a man who also has relationship with women, um, it completely changes your perspective on on life on you your issues change completely and i actually said to dr um, eric anderson i said to or i said about him and i think i said it to him i think he would be a great asset in a committee about masculinity because obviously somebody who can talk about masculinity from a gay point of view is very important yeah. but it should be the only perspective well, and if they were going to have that committee and they wanted a gay representative, fuck that guy, they should have me. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I kind of I, I kind of understand where you're coming from because as, uh, as some people who have listened to me before know, I lived an unusual life in that I came out when I was young and then I actually went back into the closet for a while. Um, pursuing relationships, well, sex, sexual relationships with women while still hooking up with guys on Craigslist and somehow being able to make the cognitive dissidence go away with alcohol. Um, so I, underst I understand what you mean about the gay guys that don't really understand women per se, because I have had a little experience with women no, not um, sorry sorry I, di I didn't mean um gay guys that don't understand women i i mean gay guys that don't understand what life for straight men is like because gay men usually don't have to deal with women on a personal yeah. level and and that's kind of what i was getting at but from a bass backwards sort of way um mm -hmm. in pursuing women uh i mean obviously it never worked out very well because i didn't actually want to <clears throat> But um, I was still doing it because that's what I thought my friends at the time, well, wanted. That's what I had convinced myself. Um, and so I do understand what it's like 
to a certain extent, like what it means for like a straight man to be, you know, kind of defined by whether or not they have a woman um, mm -hmm. and the sort of different expectations and different ways that they're treated versus a, a gay man. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Sprints. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of things like mm -hmm. once like I um I've uh, always kind of uh, as a gay guy my um, being that I've always been such a uh, aside from my voice um, I've always been such a dude's dude like I I'm um, you know really psychotically good at video games and was like I was when I was in high school I was a better DJ than my friends who are in college um, and they were all straight guys and I would like help teach, teach them how to DJ and so they all like really respect me as this this you know like intelligent um, guy and um, it got to be the point where um, they would ask me questions about girls like they would be dating girls and I would often know the girls and they'd be like, yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of think she's mad at me. I mean, do you think that she's mad at me? And we would like have these like long talks and then they'd be like, yeah, I really appreciate talking to you because it's weird. It's like, I feel like you understand girls better than most of the other guys do, but you're still a guy. And I was like, huh, maybe that's true. And so I kind of assumed that role and it got to the point where in adult life, I was able to be um, uh, one couple in particular who is now married and they have a kid. Uh, I was able to be the best friend that was, um, you know, they, they each of them had better friends than me separately, but I was the person who is best friends with both of them. And so wow. when, when they would talk about each other to me, I was able to be like, well, I think that he probably thinks like this because when I talk to him and, and she'd be like, Oh, actually that makes sense. You know? And I, I, um, I completely agree. I think that a gay man or some gay man can be a great mediator between men and women in relationships. But I think that gay men would have a hard time to be a media. Uh, well, they some, would be, they, they, I think they would have a hard time being, a real shoulder to cry on if a straight man has a woman a problem with his wife and he actually just wants to let his frustration out i think he would rather go on a bender with a straight guy it's a shame that uh, yeah probably 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 but um i was just gonna say like from 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 having those um uh those experiences and and getting close enough to um, starting to understand how different it is um, because, you know, guys did open up to me and everything. I learned just how little I know about what it's, you know, like, like for example, if, um, if a girl gets mad at a guy that she was dating and she starts spreading bad rumors about him, how devastating that is to him. Like how, you know, like if, if, um, if if she's saying untrue shit about like like let's say he got drunk and he yelled at her on the phone one time um and she was you know telling people that he was like threatening her or some shit and he's like i didn't threaten her i fucking threatened to fucking leave her that's what i did and now people are thinking that i threatened her because of fucking gossipy ass blah blah you know what i mean yeah. and and he's terrified of what that is going to 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 be like and 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 so that's why that's why straight guys kiss women's asses all the time is because of shit like that like they've been th or they've seen their friends go through that like just these these little things and gay guys don't mostly know that and um and that that makes it really hard to understand straight men i for, for gay oh, guys i think i i can i can give you a nice example and i i, I um haven't talked about that yet um so uh, my girlfriend, um, we, a couple of nights ago, um, we were in the bathroom and I was sitting on the floor in the bathroom and she, she tried to put some cream in my face, um, to, yeah, just to, for, for a joke. And I really didn't want the cream in my face. And I was like, no, don't do it. And I really meant it. And she could tell that I meant it and, but she still did it. And in a split second, I lashed out and I gave her a little smack on the on the cheek. 
And it was really just like a tiny smack just to say, hey, I said no, respect that. And I immediately apologize. I was, I'm like, oh, sorry, but I really didn't want you to do that. I didn't want you to touch my face. And she immediately started crying, like big time. And all of a sudden, I was in that place. I was an abusive boyfriend where, honestly, it was like, it was ridiculous. And she didn't. It didn't hurt her. I asked her, I was like, I, it didn't hurt you. And she was like, no, but that to me is the biggest sign of disrespect. And because she immediately put herself into a victim position, I was the perpetrator. I was the bad guy. And I said, well, if it had been the other way around, if I had put cream into your face and you had slapped me in the face even harder, I would have just laughed. And it would have been a fun situation. And instead, it was this this relationship crisis because something horrible happened where nothing horrible happened. And I think that's a huge problem for a lot of straight guys that they're, they have to walk on eggshells because no matter what they do, if they like a woman can raise their voice, a guy can't raise his voice because they are immediately perceived as aggressor, as dangerous and stuff like that. And that's pretty much what, what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've um, witnessed uh, it's, it's, it's not simply confined to um, just a few women, but it's uh, the women's friends or people on social media. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually was telling Allison about a, a specific thing when we talked to her a few weeks ago. Um, there was this this man who I don't even know how I'm friends with this guy on Facebook. I'm friends with you know well over a thousand people, and I just don't remember all of them. Um, and He's like this, you know, probably middle-aged guy right now. Uh, by by now, he's you know he's well over forty, definitely probably over fifty. I I I've probably known him for a long time, so I I don't even fucking have any idea how old he is anymore. But he's married, and he um he's friends. Everybody he knows is like feminists and stuff. You know, he's a far leftist. He lives in probably um, the San Francisco Bay Area, and um there was some. He's, he's, I don't even remember what he shared anymore, but it was um, just something about politics or I, something that reminded me of feminism or something, you know, in some, in some way. And I, maybe it was about rape or male privilege. I don't know. And I decided to, uh, one of my patented, uh, you know, I, I write out a whole paragraph debunking, you know, like, oh, this is actually not true. Men are the overwhelming victim of this and this and this and, you know, da, 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 da. And immediately I had not one, but two women um, arguing. Um, they, they, they made a sub comment thing un under my comment mm -hmm. and they were, they weren't even arguing with me. They were just throwing insults, you know, it, and it was, and it was very, very blatant, you know, because I had the facts on my side and, um, the, the thing is, um, it became very clear to me after, um, just a few minutes of this, that they weren't doing anything besides trying to make a whole lot of noise and cause a scene on this guy's, um, profile and outnumber me and just be really obnoxious, hoping that he'd want it to end and that maybe he'd unfriend me because if he were to unfriend me, then it would all end. And he also... Um, they they knew perfectly well that being that he's a straight guy and they're probably friends with his wife, mm -hmm. they knew perfectly well that he would never unfriend one of them or anything mm -hmm. like that. And so they could just walk all over him and just be as annoying as they wanted. And he even said at one point, he was like, hey, you know, I don't agree with this Prince guy, but um, I don't know if the if all the bullying is necessary. That's, and, that's exactly it. It's bullying. It's constant. Yeah, oh, it, it, it was. No, and here's what's funny. Here's the funny thing. So he just said, I, um, he said, hey, you guys, um, I don't have an opinion. on. I think he just said, I don't have an opinion on this, but the bullying isn't necessary. And then once he said that, um, you know, I, 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 I continued trying to maintain my point. But then another girl jumped in. So there was three on me. And they said, oh, yeah, this Prince guy is a bully. He's such a bully. I can't believe he's bullying us. And I was like, uh, I'm pretty sure he's not talking about me. And they were like, oh, yeah? Well, who were you talking about? And I was like, yeah, please do tell us. Who 
are you talking about? Were you talking about me, the guy who's not insulting people, who's trying to stick to arguments? Or are you talking about the three people ganging up on me? Because I don't know how I could be bullying all three of them on your yeah. timeline. And seriously, it went on for hours. And he posted occasionally, but he wouldn't just say, it's the girls. You're bullying him because he he was terrified of it. You could tell that he was like, oh, crap. Why did I even say the word bully? Because now I have to be honest at some point because I, I can't, you know, like, so he. I think he was hoping that maybe I would say something mean and then he could say it was me the whole time or something because then he wouldn't get in trouble with his wife or, I, you know, I don't, mm. I don't really know. Uh, but um, it was really funny because after a while, um, I was like, look, look you're obviously afraid to just admit what everybody what everybody can see which is that these three women are terrorizing not just me but even you because you're terrified of admitting what's going on here which is that they're tyrants they're bullies and they obviously police their um their social media network very 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 studiously and you know perfectly well that if you ever defied a single one of these women like if you if you made any one of these women mad then they would do the exact same thing that they're doing to me to you somewhere else and you know Definitely. that perfectly well and, and, it's, and it's it's so easy for them to just throw in certain words to completely destroy your reputation yeah yeah it doesn't need to be proven they just need to call you misogynist they call you rape apologist and then you're in that room and you can't get out of that anymore well what's really really funny is right right when i said that i said you know i, I made that point like like you're terrified of these women and um you you know that they would do the same thing to you that they're doing to me one of them said yes it would be very telling if you unfriended one of us and we yeah. would i would definitely judge you like i'll, I'll call him exactly. brian i'll call him brian Brian, it would mean a lot if you sided against me. Like she, she, she made it. She, she just said it. She said yes that I was right. And so finally, finally, it, it, it ended with, with him saying, "Yes, I was saying that Prince was being bullied, and if now I want to go to sleep or, or like I want to watch a movie with my wife, um, if anybody." at all writes another comment on this stupid post i'm gonna unfriend whoever that person was and so that was the end of it and uh, um but it was it was hours and hours of this this madness and so there's this my, my, uh, my girlfriend my girlfriend gets she doesn't get mad at all but she she can't understand how how i spent so much time on twitter um fighting against these complete idiots and these ideologues and i'm like it's 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 not it's not that i write for these people i write for the people that read the threats and that can see that other people have a different opinion and that you can stand up to these to these bullies that's exactly w what it is you have to stand up to these bullies and you can't give in unfortunately yeah yeah and and, and it's and it's it's really um, standing up to them and um, make having them reveal their true colors, having them, you know, having them pull out their claws for for the world to see, and just you know, uh, watch them um, pull off the gloves, try to scratch your eyes out and punch you below the belt, all in you know, just in succession. Um, it's it's amazing um, to to see that, but most people don't notice it because most people are afraid of upsetting them. And so they don't realize it, just how awful they are. But it, but I have to say it, it is actually really energy con consuming when you are arguing rationally and you bring up points, but then um, one of the one of the women or one of the social justice warriors just posts, um, you're trash and she yeah. gets like 500 likes and yeah. you actually bring up real data and debunk everything they say and you get like three likes and but the thing is these three people usually will write something and like back you up rationally with other facts and you're like i'm so glad that the smart people are on my side but yeah. unfortunately the majority are just the stupid follow followers, the the people that don't actually read all the, all the information. All they need to do is 
like the your trash. Yeah, or or, or it would say, um, stop mansplaining, bro. You exactly. Know? exactly. Yeah, I but mean, I don't. I don't even think it's the majority because I I don't think it's the majority opinion. I think it's the majority of people that are willing to get engaged. Like I, I think I, I think I, that there I, I, I think that most people at this point, you know, like for example, my mother who is seventy four years old was subscribed to Ms. Magazine when I was a kid, you know, like total second wave feminist, uh, true believer. Um, she read the Jordan Peterson book and I sent her, you know, interviews of debates of Jordan Peterson and, and she loves him. She's like, oh my God, he's great. She, she wants to, you know, be 30 years younger and marry him. I guess. Yes. <laughs> like, is, is she going to tell your mom he's married? She, she, didn't, she didn't say that, but I... I, I is she going to become a patient of his just so she can talk to him? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and, but, but, like, you know, if, 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 if that's the type of minds who... And granted, I mean, she's my mother. I talk to her about these issues a lot anyway. But um, people's... That's the... the Jordan Peterson um, is the biggest person, but you know all sorts of people are are winning the arguments. But people have been Dave, uh, Dave under Dave Rubin, for example. Yeah, um, people have been under the feminist trance for so long. Even themselves, you know, like I was never a self-professed uh, hardcore feminist in the way that like I went around calling myself a feminist and really like arguing on feminist like it, arguing for feminism because i didn't really have to i was a gay guy and i you know lived in san francisco for seven years everybody i knew was a gay guy i didn't i never thought about it that much um but even me like i thought that rape culture was a thing i mean I, and i still sort of think that it's a thing like i still think that there are cultural influences that lead to dehumanization and potentially you know like peer pressure behind gang rapes that that is a thing that happens. Saudi Arabia. Well, you no, know, but it happens in the United States. There are gang rapes, like especially if you look into places like the black community, and the, mm, there, the there, there's, there's there's white guys that have gang rapes too. It's yeah, not unheard but, of. And I really, really doubt though that there's that rape culture though. Well, that's... okay, no, but but just keep in mind. Think about it. Um, how many gang rapes like that? Like, okay. Uh, in the black community, they call it running a train on a girl. Like, um, and that's you know, like they they convince a girl to come over to a house, and a bunch of guys totally they run a train on her, and they all have sex with her. Yeah, um, okay, but, 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 but okay, so, but here's here's that is not per definition rape. The thing is that a woman a woman can say, well, obviously, if it's rape, if it's proper rape, meaning that she says no, but the guys still do it that yeah. is rape that, that, that is rape yeah yeah if she goes over if she gets drunk and agrees to have sex with a lot of guys that's obviously not rape but it's yeah. it's a cultural thing where where and and to be honest i think that is a problem with porn i'm not a huge fan of porn and i think too many people nowadays grow up watching hardcore porn and thinking that um that it's completely normal for straight couples for straight couples to have um, anal sex and to um, yeah to share your girlfriend with other guys and stuff like that. Um, I think that there is a lot of pre cultural pressure, sexual and and um, sexual. I'm going to call it deviation um, based on the con consumption of porn. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, and that, that, that yeah, I, I think that that that, that it, it can be encouraged um, through pornography to a certain degree. And see, this is the uh, the small sliver of truth that is is potentially worth examining, which would be the the cultural um, uh, feelings and attitudes that can potentially manifest itself in glorifying, um, you know, rape and uh, sexual violence, like. My mom was just reading a book about a black male who was in one of these experiences where him and his homeboys or whatever um, gang raped a girl. And he was 13 and he had actually never had sex with a girl. And he was pressured into fucking her and he, wow. could, he couldn't get his penis erect and he just kind of went behind her and humped up against her but didn't actually fuck her and just pretended for the other guys. Yeah. Now... So that that was obviously a cultural thing within his peer group. Like that was an actual 
like you, 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 he was proving himself to the other guys. Now, does that happen in Japan? Probably not very often. And so, yeah, that well, is. It happens the, in India. It happens in no, India. No, it, it sure happens in India. But, um, but, but, so, so that that idea is worth examining to a certain degree. But that is about five percent of what rape culture is to feminists. Like feminists are wacky and just take it like you know 20, 30, 40 times further and and everything's rape culture to feminists and then they but then they also want to have their cake and eat it too and like it's like oh but also don't slut shame us exactly that's the thing i mean they they actually they don't give women any agency they don't say well girl if you get completely wasted uh, and go home with a guy, maybe you have a little bit of blame as well. Maybe don't get completely wasted. Mm -hmm. um, and and if, the gay, if the guy is drunk as well, then sorry, but it, it, you can't say if a woman is drunk, she can't give consent, but if a man is drunk, he can give consent. You, you can't say that. Yeah. So, so the point I was making um, when I started this whole little thing with the, down the rape culture was that I spent many, many years of my life um, just assuming that the feminist stuff was true because I could imagine what they were talking about. I could imagine these situations where the little black boy is pressured into having sex to impress, you know, teenagers that were older than him. And I could imagine, oh, yeah, yeah. And since I was gay, I didn't really have to think about it much. And so, or like, you know, if you're a middle aged white woman, you hear these stories about these violent gang rapes where they're sticking st sticking a softball bat into someone's some girl's vagina and you're like this is so horrible that th this didn't happen when i was a kid except for it probably did um but you know like I, I i can imagine people are thinking to themselves oh that all sounds so believable and you never hear a countering argument and now it is only only now that we're we're starting to have a men's movement that is really hitting the mainstream and the mainstream you know people like jordan peterson or camille Paglia, um who people are starting to hear from more and more um it's not simply that people are listening and they're agreeing with it but they're having to think to themselves wait i actually agree with that guy but not but 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 not not only are they thinking to themselves i agree with that guy but they're thinking i agree with that guy and all this crap that I heard for the last 25 years, I'm not sure if I agree with it anymore. And that's a really big deal. So people aren't going to come right out and say, wait, I just doubted everything I learned for the past 25 years because I started paying attention to people like Jordan Peterson. And that's why you don't see so much engagement, but it doesn't mean that their mind isn't changing. Then also you got to figure if you change your mind on Facebook, you're going to potentially have a swarm of angry feminists coming at you. Oh, you know you will. <laughs> well, like I like I like I I've, I've kicked the hornet's nest a few times and it's been it's been fun. I called some of them Republicans and they shut the fuck up. It was hilarious. I don't I don't post anything MRA on my Facebook because I do not want to get into these conversations with my friends. Um, I only do MRA stuff on Twitter because it's my, it's like my porn name. It's not that I'm hiding it from friends, but I'm like, yeah, I don't even want to go down this road uh, because people just wouldn't understand it. I think that one of the issues that's, it's kind of related, but on a slightly parallel track to what we're talking about, we talk a lot about the frustration of showing facts and making rational arguments and the other side never seems to get it or care. And I think the problem is that we are, um, we both, we think that we're uh, approaching this from a similar point of view, that the reason that the social justice warriors are so, uh, hell bent on this is because they've thought this through and they uh, you know this is what they believe uh so we assume that when we demonstrate with facts and argument that they will you know have to at the very least reflect on their ideas except the problem with social justice is that it isn't particularly rooted in any kind of logic and I'm not saying that to be pejorative I literally mean it is a philosophy that is baked I'm, into feelings so much an ideologue. Yeah. yeah 
I mean, it's not even ideologue. It's like emotional log. Like, oh, yeah, that, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I mean, like, how do you feel? My truth. Everything is subjective. There's no ob objective. You know, basic, the re and one of the reasons that they do this is because you can't disprove how someone feels. Yeah. Even if you can show that the reason they feel that way is wrong, their feelings may persist. A, a great example, not in this particular subject but for instance i was just having a conversation with my husband about my sister and um that's a uh that's a sticky relationship those two and uh the problem that i've run into with both of them to, uh is that um even though i can demonstrate okay you know what you you guys had this issue and you, you know now this was done and this has been filled even though you i can demonstrate that you know objectively the relationship is better and a lot of the things that they have you know, issues that they have with each other have changed. The fact is the feelings still remain. And so the kind of antipathy to a certain extent, not so much now, but the antipathy and the underlying feelings have not changed, even if the objective observations have. And so with you have social justice warriors, the thing is really all you have to do is um, watch them talk. And when you start to whittle their, down their arguments, at a certain point, they'll realize that their argument is being, it's not getting the desired effect. So they'll just throw in an emotion or a label, basically kind of like a grenade saying, fuck this. Oh, I, I oh absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Then they come with a racist or homophobe or with what whatever slur to shut you down. Yeah. I, I was, while, while you were saying that, I was thinking um, sort of the, um, so, so social justice is 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 literally literally, and I, I don't mean like sorta. I mean like you can trace this very explicitly. Social justice is rooted in American communism. It's the same thinkers, the same scholars, rebranded, um, like you know, like they were mentored by some some of some some of this, these people that. Um, are still living um, were full-on communists in the 1950s and then there was a, a movement called the anti anti-communist movement which was not supposed to necessarily be communist but it was all these communists that were like well we're the anti anti-communists and then they rebranded themselves to be the new left but that's all the same fucking people and the new left covets social justice as its thing and they, um, the new left is where it became very identity politics, um, and it was less concerned with like, like, because like, the, by the time the new left came around, they knew that communism failed. They knew that they didn't have any good economic ideas because they just they didn't and they knew it. So they were like, well, but we still hate capitalism a lot. We still want to base our lives around smashing capitalism. And that is their purpose. That is their entire intention. And it's honestly a lot of um, nihilism. They believe, and this is this is true, like like you can you can read quotes. There's a the, the, the book I've been reading that goes through this history is called Unholy Alliance by David Horowitz. And he was a radical leftist himself. He worked with the Black Panther Black Panthers until they killed his friend. So um he really really knows his his history um with with these people and they they think that even if they had a um they overthrew the capitalist government of the united states and replaced it with some sort of kind of like they, they're not even sure what they're going to replace it with like they, they they don't even really know it's and to they, do and, something whatever that something is yeah, and, and it's going to be some sort of socialist thing but they they aren't entirely sure um they figure it would be even if it led to millions and millions of deaths it would be better than allowing capitalism to continue because capitalism kills even more people according to them that's what they think and they think that they think that they, they think that every war every war that america has ever been involved in they blame the the america entirely they think that you know and so that's 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 their mentality and so you, you, you well from a from a european point of view i can tell you we think the same way <laughs> <laughs> well okay so so you, you you take that mentality into account and you you, you look at the sjw's and it's kind of like 
these these communes, these these new leftist people, the, the the leaders of the movement, they ask you know the young blue haired person, and they say, "How do you feel?" And that person says, "Unhappy," and they say, "Good, we can work with that." Yeah. Why do you, why do you think that you're unhappy? I don't know. I'm not. No, no, no. I'll tell you why you're unhappy. <laughs> it because, wasn't a question. <laughs> because of white men, <laughs> and, and, and that's and that's what it is. But but do you know what's interesting? That's how, doesn't that sound exactly like the other side? You ask uh, a hillbilly um, if he is unhappy, and he will say yes, I'm unhappy, and then he's going to be directed towards uh, immigration or the black community or something. So it's pretty much the same way, just the opposite. I, uh, yeah, not, not really, actually, and from my experience. This is okay. just, just from my experience. Yeah, no, I, um, I spent a lot of time um, and, and still occasionally do talk to smaller channels, you know, people with less than 500 subscribers or less than 1,000. And a lot of these guys are, um, like, I've talked to guys that will self-identify as rednecks or self-identify as hillbillies, and they have very thick accents. And they, um, they, they like talking to me because they feel like I don't, I, I'm, I don't belittle them. I don't, I'm not um, stuck up, and I, um, and they can learn about how um, liberals think through me, and I can offer them advice. Like, there's this one guy that um, he's a, he's a really nice guy. He just doesn't have any. Um, good writing teacher so he he pays me to give him writing instructions sometimes mm -hmm. um and uh the thing about these people is that it, it's it's a little bit more like if 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 you were to say well 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 why are you unhappy they would say well there's a bunch of things you know i got laid off and there's not a whole lot of jobs around my area anyway. And I don't blame the black people because there's black people that get laid off too. I mean, there is a lot of immigrants that have been moving in and a lot of them are illegal. And, uh, but they didn't even steal our jobs because they're unemployed too. But then everyone tells me that it's just because I'm racist, but that's mm -hmm. not even true. And well, you know, like they have, they have all these I, things to oh, say. I, oh, I, 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 agree, I agree with you. I agree with you, but, um, I think that it's what's similar is that both of these groups are being used from above. Yeah, um, I think true. that I think that the people on the far left they are being used from the yeah I would say from the professional feminists and professional leftists and the people um, like the the rednecks or um, they especially in the last. Um, election they were being used by trump i mean trump just just tapped into their feeling of unhappiness because people judge them and don't listen to them but they have real issues they have real problems well i'd have to say it's the same emotion it's just being used for different reasons yeah the outcomes the outcomes different like that's another thing that i like living around like you know the religious more religious conservatives is when they're using that kind of us versus them emotion, they're at least trying to say, well, we can redeem these people. Whereas social justice warriors are like, no, we're going to smash everything and you're just unre irredeemable. Oh, that's and true. I also think that um, even though there are two dichotomous extremes, right and left, to a certain extent, I think really they splinter off in a lot of different directions and the two-party system creates the illusion of a binary. But... Uh, that that being given, I think that the m primary motivation of, say, the uh, capital C conservative person versus the capital L liberal person in the broadest of strokes is that conservative people tend to want to, uh, how should I say, resist what they regard as excessive meddling from whoever, because conservatives tend to be more individualistic as a whole i'm going to protect my family my job my street whatever where um as liberals capital l tend to be much more collectivistic not necessarily even just kind of in the marxist sense but sort of like we need to do this we need to protect these people like these people need help um and although they both have extremes of people that are you know, engaging in excessive in-group, out-group thinking, which is a certain, to a certain extent unavoidable in human psychology. I 
think that it, they're not really, it's not like saying, you know, um, that they're just two sides of the same coin. It's more like, let's say that extreme liberals are apples and extreme conservatives are melons. Like, you know, they're, they're both fruits, but you wouldn't really say that they are the same per se. You, you, you could like you know what I'm, I I'm I don't know if the food metaphor is the best example, but you know, <laughs> no no um, I, no no they have they have a different okay I I I see what you're saying I see what you're saying I believe um they they have a, a different set of um priorities that they look out for I would say that the priorities of the left is um protecting um the rights of minor of minority groups uh, so basically non heterosexual white people um or 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 non non white people because that you know gays count as heterosexual now um to to the, <laughs> le to the left they hate they hate gay men so um, and um they they they, they and um uh, so that's that is their priority uh, at the moment, and, and and women, at least the right women, they want to protect. Um, that's sort of, um, and they're willing to use the law to protect minority groups, um, or uh, that's that's sort of the, the 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 general value, and the conservative America um, likes to protect. Um, America and the American economy and people's ability to to uh, create to, yeah, to, pro to prosper and to create business and to be to contribute to the economy they don't want that many regulations so it's funny you know like the um, the left is willing to come up with all of these really absurd hate crime laws like making it a hate crime to um, uh refer to a non-binary person as he or she you know like you, oh you have to call them they um and if you don't you're gonna get fined in canada like they're they're totally willing to do that and they think that it's fair however you know the right goes on and on about how they're the libertarians and they're they're completely against um government laws and everything but then the second they propose that it should be a 15-year maximum jail sentence for um, Antifa to wear their little black block masks. The the right is all over it, and they're like, "Cool, fuck them, send them to jail." <laughs> that's that's oh. well, that's one thing. Like I've noticed looking at you know if you're going with the quadrant system of political spectrum versus just a line, you have conservatives and you have liberals, and they oppose each other, and they kind of ignore that the intersectional left and libertarians exist. And they're just, they go, like, like liberals and conservatives go after each other. Like, if you've, I've actually seen a lot of conservatives post stuff. They make no difference between anyone who is to the left of them, just like a intersectional or even just standard Democrat makes no difference between anyone to the right of them. I think the biggest yeah. thing that affects what kind of mm -hmm. conservative you're going to get, mm -hmm. and this is actually a variation that I don't think we see on the left, mm -hmm. but the biggest difference between what kind of conservative you're going to get has to do with the reasons that they're conservative. Mm -hmm. If they're yeah. conservative because of, or large, or it, if they're conservative largely because they're extremely religious, that's a different kind of conservative than the a libertarian kind of like you know get off my front lawn kind of conservative because yeah, can, or, or a constitutionalist yeah. it's, mm -hmm. like, it's different because often you can reason very well with the get off my lawn conservatives who are like sort of like you know what i don't care if you have sex with like a man a woman a, a blow-up doll just don't put any more taxes like, on, on my business and get the hell off my lawn i can deal with that person i actually like that person sometimes mm -hmm. because at yeah. least you know where they stand but when you get into the like, well, you know, I'm a conservative because I want to protect traditional values mm -hmm. as defined by this book that I follow, written by people mm -hmm. thousands of years ago. And by the way, the person in the sky told me that I, you have to follow it, and if you don't, you're a bad person. That's why I'm a conservative. Yeah, I, I, I think the difference that you're describing is uh, faith-based political beliefs and uh, logic-based political beliefs. Mm -hmm. And it, it's kind of a shame because, okay, so so you would have the, the three... Uh, so, so there'd be like four groups then. So there's the faith-based leftists who would just be the like intersectional feminists who are just mm -hmm. like 
yeah, we need to stick up for women and transgender people and black lesbians in wheelchairs, and we need to stick. And that's it's like, okay, well, why? Because we have to, you know. And that's just sort because, of because uh, because yeah, because yeah. they're not because white men have been given the benefits for thousands of years and it's the turn of the minorities and it's like okay but that's not really a reason but, but that's that is their their faith that is like they, they they just believe that and then on the other side of the coin you have the religious conservative traditionalist christian type people yeah. um but what's interesting is that so both of those people you can't really necessarily have a logical argument with very easily like they, they but what's interesting is that you look at the actual people who have real political beliefs on the left and the right. On the one hand, on the right, you have the libertarian type, constitutionalist type people who are like, well, no, our, our nation, Western nations were founded in enlightenment values. The United States has the best constitution because we have the First Amendment, especially that makes it so that, blah, blah, you know, they, they can go on and on about all the reasons why our, our uh, the United States has been the most successful nation in history and that we should stick to these things. And they and they really do make a powerful, I, just, powerful. Just a, sec just a second. I, I can't tell you how much that America, America is the best nation in the world rubs us Europeans in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, can, I can definitely understand that, and I used to feel very adamantly against that, but there, I have to tell you, I used to be a complete Europhile. I thought, you know, America, because I was much more liberal before, I thought America, oh God, you know. Wait, 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 guys, wait, guys, wait. We, can, we can get back to this, um, I want, but I want to finish my thought, because I, I can yeah, finish it. your thought, because you've all, I haven't talked about all the groups. Yeah, yeah, so I can finish it quickly. So there's the people who can get into, um, you know, libertarianism um, and also constitutionalism, and they can come up with some very compelling arguments. And, um, like, I don't agree with all of them, certainly, and, and they never agree with each other. That's the other thing. They always, they're always they always arguing with each other. Of like, well, that's part of being a libertarian is disagreeing yeah. with absolutely everyone. It's like, yeah, being, yeah. it's like being goth or punk. Yeah, but at least they're willing to, like, have logical arguments but then on the other sometimes, side of the point, I, I would say sometimes well, well i would say more so than <laughs> the other side of the coin which would be the hardcore intellectual leftists oh, who, definitely. who are some version of you know like um advanced um you know intersectional feminist uh, like like actual uh academic um marxist type person who believes in some sort of equity and inclusion and quotas and uh they, they they actually have you know long justifications for believing in affirmative action very strongly and all and all these unfortunately things. it's based on a utopia that will never yeah. work and we and we know doesn't work but they yeah. can come up with but they can come up with elaborate an elaborate list of reasons why it would supposedly work maybe and go through this long you know like they can they can drag you into a you know it's like watching a fucking contrapoints video and it's like oh my god no everything you're saying is literally wrong but i can see why if i was you know 16 years old you would sound like you were making sense and that really yeah. is that and and that's what's really annoying about it it's like um so like you take this this these four different types of people and the best that we've got is this um constitutionalist and libertarian type people because they at least they stick to things that there is evidence for like there is evidence that the american constitution does work pretty well Whereas, like, you, do you see what I'm saying? Yep. And now yeah, we can I, talk about what you guys were just saying. Uh, I, I'm just going to bring up my little thing uh, to what you were saying, uh, my friend, about uh, I know that American exceptionalism is uh, pro probably pretty annoying to other countries. I get it because, like I said, I used to be a complete Europhile and I was all like, oh, my God, you know, when I get... When I get older, all I want to do is just move to Europe, where they're pr so progressive and everything is perfect. With it, you know, that that's what I thought when I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, you know what? Honestly, though, like, so you live in Scotland, correct? Yeah. And you use Twitter. Yeah. You're brave. <laughs> that I will say <laughs> that is one thing that I really came to appreciate about my country. Um, 
is the fact that I know that no, ma the, no matter how offensive I am here, that I will never go to jail for making a joke on the internet. <laughs> And that is that. See, I, see, I'm from I'm from Germany, and in Germany, and you got even um, worse over in, there. In, well, in Germany, there are certain things that you grew up with that are just completely normal for you. So, for example, you can't draw a swastika, or you can't say Heil Hitler, or you can't say Stieg Heil. So, all the Nazi stuff is banned, and it's. Um, it's it's forbidden and you can go to jail for that and but because you grow up in in this deep shame for your past which is obviously understandable um it does make sense to you but mm -hmm. at, at one point I, at one point you start to wonder why um why the right is not allowed to do certain things but antifa um is allowed to do certain things um you start to wonder why it's not allowed, but this is not law. It's not law, but it's um, culture. it's culture that you just can't say anything against Israel. Um, it's actually part of the law, um, obviously, that you can't deny the Holocaust. So if you deny the Holocaust in Germany, you go to jail. Um, and where where I'm like, well, what about some weirdo conspiracy theorist that just thinks that it didn't happen? And he's he's like, well, I haven't seen any like palpable proof for it. Um, I'm like, okay, why why does this person have to go to jail even though his views are offensive? So I I do appreciate the free speech thing in America, but we all know that even though you do have free speech, there is all uh, there is still a cultural cultural pressure on speech. So even though yes. you are free to say things, you can't say things. If I, you say if you say nigger on television, that's it. You're out. I appreciate the distinction you're making and it is true. But again, I have to draw the distinction. No, social fallout and cultural pressure can be quite awful, just as bad as legal ramifications, but they're still not legal ramifications. At the end of the day, there, I used to think, like, for instance, like, uh, I'll use an example from America, those crazy people that took over the bird sanctuary because they disagreed with the federal government's right to own land. You guys remember that? Yep. Yeah. I remember that. Those guys were a bunch of morons, and I, as a... Uh, pretty good environment, well, good, but you know, as, as someone who believes that the environment should be protected, I did not like what they were doing one little bit. That mm -hmm. being said, though, the fact that our government had to show so much restraint towards dealing with these people because it was still, on some level, deemed to be a legitimate form of political expression, even if I find their views idiotic, abhorrent, and possibly even dangerous, I still don't find that mm -hmm. as idiotic, abhorrent, and dangerous as the idea of being able to go to jail, being like, you know, having committed an actual crime in the eyes of the law because of something that I said that didn't okay. actually hurt anyone. Well, well, to be honest, okay, from, from a European point of view, you, you don't, it usually does not happen that you go, go to jail unless you um you invoke uh violence so you want vi you, you you say yeah. oh let's kill everybody and i as far as i know that's the same in america but that's not entirely true though merkel has thrown people in jail at least for the night for liking things on facebook and i mean well, like first of all merkel merkel wouldn't do work Mer merkel wouldn't do that i haven't heard about that and to be honest to me, it really, really sounds like it's blown out of proportion from certain uh, conservative media in America, because it's actually not that bad. The only thing that you that Germany and I would say the UK is really, really not keen on is a uh, Nazi uh, insignia, and, and that's uh, that's proper Nazi insignia. You can you can be anti-immigrant if you if you don't incite violence. Uh, you don't go to jail so it's it's really not 
it's it's actually not as different as in America. Um, and I personally would say that the government pressure um, is not as uh, dangerous and as bad as society's pressure, especially when it comes to the media. I think that the well, biggest wait, problem, but the, I, I, the, just a second, the biggest okay. problem to me in, in in Europe is that as soon as you are conservative, as soon as you say, um, I think there should be restriction to emigration, the media, and you go on the street to demonstrate against mass immigration, you are per definition by the media, um, a Nazi. And that is the problem. Have you heard the, of the case of Count Dankula? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard of him, and I think it's, it's ridiculous. On the other hand, it, it's again, it's the, the fact that, he, the, that the, he made the puck say, uh, or that he said, uh, gas the Jews, which is incitement of violence in certain ways. I'm not supporting that he went to jail, and I thought it was... Uh, a joke in bad taste um, and I find it outrageous that what what happened to him but I actually find it worse what happened to uh, Tommy Robinson oh yeah we'll yeah but like I mean okay but so when I think of inciting violence I think of you know somebody like Antifa saying punch a Nazi and then they show up and start punching Trump supporters and we mm -hmm. see and we know that that happens and I well but see and here but even then even then it's a little bit more like Okay, I wouldn't want to say that that person who said punch, even though even though we know it did that those sentiments did lead to physical violence, like even though we know that that happened, I wouldn't want to say that the person who said that is should be held responsible because they didn't say go punch that specific person over there. You know what I mean? Like, and they, that's that's actually a distinction that I want to bring up real quick before we lose relevance. Like, um, in I don't think it is in Europe, but in America, one of the things that has to be the caveat for that whole inciting of violence, it has to be deemed a credible attempt to actually incite. Be humor, context is paramount in American ex cases of expression because, mm -hmm. and the fact that in the Count Dankula case, the, the context of the video was completely disregarded. The fact that it was obviously a form of expression not an a credible attempt to incite violence that is the key i say american european distinction because i understand that the european closet is crowded with many skeletons and so is ours all all countries have crowded skeletons but it's the kind of skeletons that they have that may determine the kind of laws that they have and the european systems of justice and the European systems of, uh, let's say, the, your constitutions are, they sound really good, un, but, I've, but until you start to actually test them in areas where it's uncomfortable or where things are a little bit murky, that's where they start to make me uncomfortable because, again, the threat of being arrested, even it, you can, yes, I, I'm afraid, I'm a, a familiar with the idea that, well, you know, that's rarely done or that I doubt that would ever happen. The fact that it's an option. Let me rephrase this away from speech to something. So let's say that like you live in a town and you're told like, okay, so just so you know, there is a, uh, the government reserves the right to shell this town with artillery because it was built on a test a firing range. Don't worry, they won't do it. But the mm -hmm. fact that they have the option to do it, even if they've never done it in a hundred years, is not the makes it a place I would not want to live. See, then, okay, uh, I, I, I see. Uh, it. I think depending on where you come from, where you live, you. Um, you feel very differently, obviously. For example, obviously. Um, for for me as a European, uh, your gun laws um, are horrifying because, like, um, like obviously conservative Americans, they say, oh, we need to keep our guns to protect ourselves. In Europe, we say, we don't need guns because 
there is nobody I have to protect myself from. Well, and, there is now. Well, yeah, yeah. well, no, well no, that, I, I, I definitely see the uh, the argument, and, and, and yeah. technically, like you can look at statistics, you are way likelier to die of a gunshot wound mm -hmm. if you own a gun in your house. Yeah, and and, and, and Amer America has like when you look at the statistics, I mean, America is just so high on gun gun crime; it's ridiculous, and. Um, and there are so many things in America. I, I like America, but there are so many things about America that are just so fucked up. Like, for example, the fact that you have to be um, rich or have to have the backup of, um, of the lobbies to gain political power. For example, Angela Merkel, she is a completely normal person with no financial background. She, Her party doesn't need big financial background. She is the chancellor of Germany because she's qualified and she did a good job as a politician. Um, and the fact that the American um, political system is so completely um, based on fin finances and bribes to us, that is absolutely outrageous. Mm -hmm. That's one point that, that I can't understand that you guys don't don't point out more as 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 a as a country and the other thing that that because I was talking about that on Twitter the last three days about I don't know if you heard the Olivia Munn case where she um, Olivia Munn outed a Is guy that the video, the uh, video? that's the, the, well, the, the yeah, child molester it. movie thing yeah uh, 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 not child molester not child molester so she yeah. another not that either they, the outed, emailer he emailed yeah. she outed a co-actor who 10 years ago um texted with a 14 year old girl while he was 37 and they only texted and one of his text events was you you wanted i wanted but that doesn't make it right so and he went to jail for six years um he that's so messed up that that is excessive to, that, that's doubt. to me to me that's actually ridiculous because i'm european and mm -hmm. yeah. he he's a lifelong um sex offender and Olivia Mann outed him and now the all these people are like, oh, he should not be allowed to li work in Hollywood and um, he should have to announce what he did um, so that people that work with him are aware what a horrible person he is and stuff like that. You are, the sex offender laws in America, the fact that the legal age is 18 is so completely absurd to us Europeans. In Germany, yeah. it's 14. In uh, most European countries, it's either um, 14, 15, or 16. And the fact that you can be a sex offender if you're 18 and you're having sex with your 17-year-old girlfriend, to me, that's much more threatening that than, than that you can go to jail for saying Heil Hitler. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, wait, I have to... Well, it it varies I, by state. Okay. So like, I, when I lived in Nevada, it's 16 there. And okay. in the South, it's like 16 oh, wow. for the most oh, part. That's cool. yeah. So I have something... To, so I think that we can kind of um, move on, because I, I want to mm -hmm. talk actually specifically about that um, that video a bit. Um, and and um, I have one last little thing. I think that's a good finisher for the, uh, the topic of kind of like... Um, Comparative uh, America, Europe. Yeah, or, or or comparative anywhere. So um, I was watching this documentary about um, Piranha um, in the Amazon, you know, like, and, uh, you know, to us, Piranha are scary. That's like a very scary thing that if you jump into a part of the water, a bunch of little fish will come up and like, you'll be dead in 45 seconds. That's fucking terrifying, right? And but that's a lie. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. It's not entirely a lie. Like they can fucking clean you to the bone. Like they, those little fuckers can kill you. Now, but not in forty seconds. <laughs> well, maybe not, no, but you could die. Like you could have wounds. They, they can injure you quite severely. Yeah, it's the blood loss will get you. Yeah, yeah, but no, but they, 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 they clean like they show demonstrations of how how quick quickly they can clean um clean things up, and it's pretty quick. And send me, um, send me the link. <laughs> So the the and the thing is about piranhas is that they don't attack things that are used to swimming. So they don't attack other fish, or um, like they they only attack things that thrash a lot. They detect something that is moving really really um, unnaturally. Yeah, um, because they they know that that's something that they can eat. 
and that's how they've evolved. And wow. so, um, if um, so, so the locals, um, and and here's the thing: people in the Amazon who actually live there are very, very poor. And mm -hmm. so, the Amazon River um, is one of the best sources for food. And so, they live right on the water because they can fish and. Um, that's a great way for them to get food, but they have families and they, and, and they showed some of these like little huts that are on top of docks. And like, there's just balance beams between two of the, two of the, the, the rooms and, the, and, and you just kind of have to like walk five or six feet across. And it's like, wait, but you have like a three-year-old kid and they're, and they're like, Oh yeah, well we tell him not to go on the, the, the little thing until he gets better at walking. And it's like, and, and the Americans were like, that's, that's crazy. And, and then, and, and so the Amazonian people said, they said to him, they're like, well, but yeah, but in America, all a four-year-old has to do is walk 20 feet out into the road and he'll get hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's how you can sort of compare um, the two things. So, and I think it's a lot, uh, it, it, there's a lot of ways of comparing Europe and, and the United States in that kind of way. We could do a whole channel about it. it. <laughs> There, so, there are great things about America, and there are great things about Europe, and uh, to be and to be honest, and there are great things about the Middle East and Arab countries. And we are very blind to the positive aspects of certain cultures right. and certain countries, where we are like, oh, actually, there are certain things that we could adapt, and there are certain things that they should adapt, maybe. Um, but we are a little bit, we are all a little bit too arrogant, thinking that we our way is the right way. I feel like it's the get you get medical if you get HIV kind of situation, but that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, yeah. But okay, so I want to talk about that video that you made. Um, and um, because um, one of the things that you know, America, the so supposed uh, land of the free, land of free speech and everything, and a lot of that is true to a certain degree. Except for if you even ever, ever say publicly that you think it's okay for a 20-year-old to have sex with a 15-year-old or something. Die. You, you will it, die. Because like Milo Yiannopoulos, for example, Milo Yiannopoulos, his career in mainstream Republican um, circles. Uh, yeah, in, in mainstream uh, Republican punditry was severely crippled, and now he's semi-obscure. Um, he had to stop working for Breitbart, and the, the reason why Milo no longer works for Breitbart and he now only really has his, his dedicated cult following is because he talked about himself being um, the uh, legal uh, victim of... Um, having sex with men when he was either 13 or 14 who were much older. And he said that he was the predator. He pursued them. And um, he never said that people um, should do this. He just said that it, it happens and that it's when, when you're gay. It's, it, he said that he learned from it or something like that. And um, he doesn't feel bad about it. I don't, I don't remember exactly what he, he made. A, he made a joke out of it. He, he he basically yeah. said that you could that there were you could get something positive out of it in certain situations even if it's but he said that the law should remain as it is it just for him he didn't particularly feel like a victim but but I find that, it I mean uh, let, let's be let's be honest I mean um, can can a fourteen year old boy have positive a positive sexual experience with an older woman of course. And can a 14-year-old boy have a positive sexual experience with a man? Of course. And the same goes for girls. Can a 14-year-old girl have a positive sexual experience with an adult? Yes. Um, it's, it's, they can. And to be honest, I think the, when it comes to sex, the law has to look at individuals and not at a strict age group simply because some people mature much earlier some people mature much much later and i think that it's one of those things where i think that uh like europe is much better because they're like well you can have you are allowed to have sex when you're 40 14 but 
if the other person the other person is not allowed to have sex with you if the other person is in a position of power or um, if you're a relative or if the 14 year old is not capable of giving consent due to emotional that they are not emotionally developed enough and that's something that um, judges would have to determine i think you have to be very careful with that though like i think we're kind of stuck between two extremes i'll put, I'll put it to you this way i think that in many ways the american system is you know we still we, we're de we're descended from puritans so exactly. we st so we still do have a very kind of you know puritanical vein let's say it's i don't think it's really a huge part of our culture anymore but it's definitely part of the dna um so that does lead to situations where you know you have people being called predators when really they probably shouldn't be but yeah. At the risk of devolving into, you know, American European comparatism again, which like again we could spend years doing. Um, the problem when you get a little too soft on the subject, because it is true, there are some individuals that mature faster. However, when you make it okay for some of them to do it, it makes it more permissive for more of them to do it. And it does allow a certain amount of pushing the envelope. I, get, like, I, have to, I have to disagree uh, from experience from Germany, and I have to agree from experience from the UK. Okay, okay so but what, Germany, about the, what about the refugee status? Like the, the, the problem we have of grooming gangs, for instance, of people taking advantage of those laws when really they're pressure, like they're, they may be similar in age, but they're still pressuring people into doing things that they're really not ready to do yet. I, yeah, I, I, um, I would say that in Germany it's uh, different because I would say that in Germany we have very good uh, sexual education. So, and I think that teenagers are uh, quite mature and make smart decisions for themselves. German where, teenagers, in, yes. Pardon? German, German teenagers. German teenagers. German teenagers. For Which is why you're uh, having where, so many problems. Where? Pardon? Which is probably why you're having so many problems, you being all of Europe at this point, because you have a massive population that isn't part of that culture or the education. It, it, to be honest, no, in Germany we don't have that big of a problem, but, but we can go back to that in a moment. But in, in the UK it's completely different. In the UK they have the youngest, the youngest um, age of motherhood overall, so we, there are quite a lot of teenage mothers. And I would say that... Um, that British teenagers um, can't cope with sexuality as well as in Germany. And I would say it's due to um, a, a weird mix of bad sex education, um, a, similar to America Puritan, like they're, they're very prudish. Um, British people are incredibly prudish when it comes to nudity and stuff like that. Um, and they are, either one moment they're very prude as soon as they get slightly drunk they're all over you and women here for example even young women young girls are sexually quite aggressive where in germany nudity is not a problem at all and we have nude beaches and everybody goes there and for some reason it takes the edge off of the um sexual Mm, obsession I would say and I would say that Germans uh, they handle sexuality very consensual very down to earth and we have almost no teenage mothers and uh, I would say that even young most most people have their first sexual experiences I would say at the age of like 15 16 and upwards and I've never heard of anybody being traumatized by that at all. Well, circumstances are everything, aren't they? <laughs> I, I think it. I think it really gets down to sexual education, and I think it's much much better to tell um, teenagers to be careful and not to write with uh, creeps on the internet and not to. Uh, go home with weirdos and don't not to get drunk at parties and stuff like that. I find that much, much uh, more productive than just banning sexuality for everybody.
And I in think, America, I think, that's that's uh, victim blaming. You try to teach people to not, you know, get drunk in public. And <laughs> yeah, I don't care about victim blaming. It's much better to raise. I, mean, uh, I, I think it's much better to raise mature people that can make decisions for themselves than the government taking all agency away from them. I, I, I am. I'm just making a joke at the expense. Yeah, of, of course. I, I understand that was a joke. <laughs> so, but. But I think that there's that's an interesting um, point to bring up that, uh, I, well, you, you didn't really make this point, but um, I'm I've never really thought about this in this way. But now that we're talking about this, I'm wondering um, if you give you know sixteen uh, year olds or fourteen year olds the um, the knowledge that they are allowed to have sex. And have to, allowed to have sex with people who are older than them, and they know that. And then the people who are older than that than them know that they aren't breaking the rules if they have sex with a fifteen year old. Um, maybe everybody approaches the relationship, the sexual relationship, in a more healthy, potentially more healthy way. So, like the the young person is less likely to to turn around and decide that they were victimized and the older person is um, less likely to be doing it out of some sort of creepy manipulative way because they, they didn't think, you know, like if because you're it's not criminal, yeah, it's not criminal. So like if, if you're a 33 year old that um, is, is only attracted to like to girls that are 16 and older or younger, if you're 33 and you're only attracted to girls that are 16 and younger, you know that you're kind of not supposed to be like that, but you you would do it anyway. And um, that, that, that's the thing. I mean, there is a huge difference between uh, pedophiles, by the way. That wouldn't yeah. be a pedophile because uh, you're a pedophile if you're into prepubescent uh, children. But if if somebody has an obsession with a certain age group, um, yeah. that 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 for me that sounds like an ex exception um and i you rarely you never hear about cases like this honestly i've never heard about that what I, the the cases that i hear about is that for example in school somebody who's uh 22 23 would uh, fall in love with uh, a girl that is uh, 16 or 15 and then the thing is how it works in germany the the parents would decide how they feel about it so they would say well um be safe and uh, you know that you shouldn't be pressured into something that you don't want to do and they would talk to the guy and say okay you're with our daughter and we expect you to behave in a certain way so that's how yeah. it would work in germany so that's and that's that's and that's um yeah, that's 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 an interesting uh, kind of a way of of of, of things. I, I, that's something I'm not familiar with. Um, we, but in the United States, and I have known, I have known heterosexual men who were very uh, well. I don't want to say very open, but they certainly told me and my friends that they were into girls that were not legal. Like they they would. Um, I, I remember watching movies with them and they would say which girl that they were thought thought was the hottest one and it was this like 15 year old girl and it was like dude simon she's like totally 15 and he's like oh you think i care you know and simon is over 30 you know and um it was very but obvious don't you, think, don't you think there is a there is a um there is a fetishization of the underage thing because it's always the forbidden fruit that is most attractive yeah, uh, like, yeah sure, 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 sure. But let me finish my thought. So yeah, okay. I think that when there is this, um, the forbidden fruit, um, and, 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 and guys know that it's, you know, that they're going to potentially get in trouble, then the, and they have to be covert about it, then they are also going to be more likely to try to manipulate the girl into having sex with them because they have to do it in the shadows and Absolutely. so they're, they're they're a little bit more likely to tell her oh yeah we're gonna have a relationship blah 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 and he is lying to her and he knows that he's lying to her and he's doing it because um he knows perfectly well that she wants to hear that they're going to be in a relationship but 
uh, she wouldn't have sex with him otherwise and but he really really wants to fuck her just just once or twice and so you're going to lead to these it's going to lead to these situations where he ends up lying to her and then she does feel like she's used and abused and then later on she does feel like a victim whereas if it was allowed the whole time maybe it wouldn't have ever been like that mm. yeah i i i think i think from again from a german point of view i think that teenagers in and the sexuality of, of I, I would say sexuality in germany is healthier than in america because it's less stigmatized it's much more normalized and uh, our bodies are more normalized. I mean, we don't have a problem being being naked, and and I think when you say that these the Puritan genes are still in you in you guys, I think that's that's a huge problem that kind of fucks you up because I I think the reason why you have such a huge porn industry and because you have these two sides on the one side America is really fucked up and on the other side America is so Puritan and I think that these are two extremes um, that actually created each other. I think I, I get what you're saying. Um, and they have a similar thing in Japan where they are a very kind of repressed culture and there is, and there is a very active porn industry. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we have you always have to be careful with making um here i'm going to sound like a real cultural relativist here but you you always have to be careful making extreme um judgments let's say about cultures broadly because it is true some cultures do sh have some advantages than others but they're usually almost all every gift has some sort of uh flip side to it which brings with it its own unique problems and by this and by this i'm not saying that no one should ever criticize anyone like i'm very open about my criticisms of many cultures uh particularly really repressive cultures like those that follow the teachings of a seventh century pedophile warlord but that's another subject um i think that we just have to oh, be but very... just a second by the way um there is a are you aware of tommy robinson oh oh yeah all youtubers Oh, okay. Okay. Um, watch. Uh, just type in Tommy Robinson Imam. He ha did a great interview with an Imam. Um, he he's an Australian Imam, and the way he talks about Islam is really fascinating. And he actually says that um, the wife of Muhammad, that was supposedly, I think, six years old when he married here, her, and nine years old when he had sex with her. Um, this imam said that that's actually a lie and that this woman was much more likely uh, around 23, 25 years old. And the reason why they came up with the lie that she's so young is because they wanted her to be completely pure and innocent, to yeah. be able to, um, to compete with um, Mother Mary. Um, and the apparently the problem was that Mohammed's favorite wife wasn't a virgin when she um, married him. Yeah, so, yeah I, I've heard that that, that um, point of uh, historical contention myself. Yeah. That it, they're not well, sure. That's true, but it's an it's a fun fact. It's an interesting. Yeah, yeah. Fact. That, that that there's two sides of, of, of how it might have been. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to talk about the whole Puritanism in American politics, I've been kind of thinking about this for the last few minutes, so that's kind of why I've been quiet. There's, with American politics, the easiest way to describe it is where and how does your Puritanism pop out? Like, for everyone who's a religious Puritan, there's going to be that one who's like, no, art is art, or sex is sex, or whatever is whatever, so it just has to be this way because I say so. Like, every, every end of politics feed into that. There's, like, that one issue... Like with libertarians, if you ever get them talking about money, they're literally with them with economics. It's it has to be this way because I say so. Because and then when you try to get them, I've I'm not talking in it, and I'm going to put this out here. The more punditry ones can usually hide this better than the average libertarian. But once you get them like going on economics, it's just no. It has we have to have the gold standard. It's like why there's a lot of downsides because I said so. It's not a like with intersectionals, you get the. Well, women have to be all dainty and you know flowery. It's not even because well reasons. It's just because I said so, and then 
Christians do a lot of the same just because yeah. I said so. A lot of these um, system, anytime you are advocating a extreme point of view or ex not even extreme, but extremely different than the mainstream at a certain point, it I think at that point, it kind of depends mm -hmm. on what kind of a speaker they are, because if, you know, if you ask someone like Jordan Peterson or, um, oh God, um, I can't I'm not talking Jordan Peterson. I'm talking the average person. I'm well, well, no, I was, I was, I was trying to. Anyway, like deep thinkers, like say Jordan Peterson, like you know, you would never have that because I said so moment. But your average person doesn't go that deep. They choose their words with less care, or they're not as uh, able to articulate themselves. I find this problem a lot with all kinds of people. Um, as someone. At, and Prince, you probably can relate to this. As 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 writers, we're very used to delving into unusual thoughts and concepts and finding just the right word, even if it's a strange word or the right arrangement of words, to express a very particular kind of thought or situation. But a lot of people who don't necessarily have huge vocabularies, or e even if they do, but they're not, you know, creative writing thinkers, they're not able to articulate some of these more abstract or un difficult concepts. And so they sort of muddle through it, choosing their words sometimes kind of clumsily. And as a result, you end up with a person who's trying to communicate something which is very real to them, but they end up doing it very badly or kind of throwing out a because reason, simply because at, you've reached the limit of their uh, communicate their communication bandwidth. Let's say they they yeah. don't they don't know how to express it any more uh, succinctly than what they've already done. I, I think you give people too much of the benefit of the doubt. To be honest, I think that uh, yeah, of course, people are limited to what they can say. But to be honest, I think the bigger problem and more common is that they are limited to what they can think what they are allowed to think because they are being too indoctrinated by whatever echo bubble they live in. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair too. I mean, I, yeah, not, it's hard. To, it's hard to. It's hard to know. I think that there's some of uh, of each that can uh, definitely. definitely there's, there's so much truth in our buffet. Come on, everyone, eat up. <laughs> yeah, well, when I, well, and when I'm trying, when I'm saying their reasoning is because I said so, it's literally I I could put in any insert random reason as to why it is, but oh, it ultimately or yeah, it, it's it's ultimately boils down. It, it ultimately boils down to my philosophy makes sense. Um, has demands is to make sense. Yeah, is well, I, it gets to. Yeah, and I've I've ran into that um before with um. Okay, I'll just say it. One time I was talking to Space Pan about um, and um, being an anarcho-capitalist. This was off air. Um, yeah. uh, and he was talking about um, anarcho-capitalism. And I was like, okay, so honestly, dude, I don't even entirely understand how it's supposed to work. And he was... <laughs> Like he, he was he was like, well, see, it would be sweet because we wouldn't need the government because, well, you have to act on the non-aggression principle and blah, blah, blah. And he kept he was trying to, like, explain it. And, and the more and more he was explaining. And I was like, dude, this kind of sounds a whole fucking lot like communism, too. Like everyone's like, well, you don't need the government because we're all just going to work together. Mm -hmm. And and he was like. You know what that would be? It would be mayhem. It would actually be like survival of the fittest that's what it would be as soon as you have anarchy it's always survival of the fittest i think that yeah, no, so 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 he was talking he was saying this um you know about he was like oh well yeah you know like we could um kind of like work together and then at one point it got to the point and he literally said i swear to god he said um uh i mean the world is ultimately more anarcho-capitalist than it's ever been in human history. And I was like, do you know what? It's actually really funny that you say that because the Bernie Sanders type people, they also say that compared to 100 years ago, we live in a socialist utopia. And he was like, yeah, I guess that people do say that. And I was like, yeah, you know, that whole horseshoe theory thing. And he said, oh, horseshoe theory isn't real. That's a left-wing invention. 
And what's really what? funny is that hardcore leftists say that horseshoe theory isn't real too. They also yeah. say that. So I well, just of course, I, I, of course, because they don't want they don't want to acknowledge that um, they're actually much closer to um, to the right than they think they are. Yeah, yeah. So um, okay. So uh, I want to uh, steer because we usually go just for about three hours and I want to steer because uh, there was one thing that I wanted to definitely bring up with you um, and we haven't talked about it yet, which is the question of mine that I wrote to you on Twitter that you made the video about. Um, and my question was, did you encounter any feminists in the adult film industry? Um, and, uh, and I said that I had, uh, but, um, but the, but the guy who I was thinking of in particular, um, is a total whack job and he's, he's, his, he's his own specific case. Um, and your answer was that I found it very interesting, which was that you didn't encounter any while you were working in the, um, industry, but you knew some people who were involved, who started becoming big activist type people after they retired. And when I thought about it, I realized that that was mostly the case with this guy. And in fact, um, and I'll, 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 I'll be honest, I'm not going to say who he, he was, but, um, this guy is fucked up. He's, he's, he's literally the most horrible person that I've ever known. And not because of, being a sex worker or anything he's just a horrible horrible human being um he yeah. ended up getting herpes which um you know you can't do scenes anymore <laughs> if you have herpes like you 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 your you, career over yeah. and so then and, and that's and that's how sex workers i mean he was somebody that um did uh uh uh, tricks. He, he prostituted himself, you know, just over Craigslist and stuff um, regularly. But but the the biggest bucks at once you get from being in a movie. That's you know the, the biggest check. And so um, he he was very um, upset, and he he started becoming a much different person. And that's when he got more into all of the activism stuff. And I think it was appealing to see himself as some sort of victim more and more because he was making less money um and he became this big feminist and then after a few years he even became transgender um and As you do and was like um went through a transition and was actually uh trying to solicit money out of people for you know transgender stuff um by making these like really tragic i, mean, I don't want to get too much about this this this, this 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 one specific guy is not the point but the thing that i really noticed that i found very striking um from knowing his circle of friends and the end uh, other people that were kind of like that, like, you know, living in San Francisco, they have places like the center for sex and culture, which is like a nonprofit devoted to like sex workers and stuff. Like there's like meetings for sex workers and like how to, how to meet people safely from rentboy.com and like crap like that. Like that's what it's like. And I knew a lot of those people. One of the things I noticed that I found very interesting was that there is a very, very big component in um uh the left and maybe with feminists explicitly um of romanticizing sex worker culture like they, they they there was entire sex worker art festivals and it, it um my friend my, i remember one time my friend trying to like get me to perform in the sex worker art festival and he was like yeah you've done you've probably done some sort of sex and i was like um well this one guy bought me a beer but he said he wanted to suck my dick and so i said okay uh does that count <laughs> like you know like like that was the closest thing you know to it that was the only thing i could come up and, uh, and he was like oh, i don't know and i was like no dude i can't be in the sex worker art show that would be totally dishonest but it's funny that you were you were completely eager to have me be in it like it was just some trendy thing and but it and then i realized it, it is it is they in san francisco and in this like far leftist activist world it is completely trendy and and for for, for whatever reason they've made it part of the political agenda to romanticize sex work do you have any in, insight about that well 
that um, there is a, hmm, um, about this like ov over glorifying sex worker. Can you guys hear me well? Because oh, yes. you were breaking up a little bit. We can okay, hear you. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so this over glorification of sex workers and stuff like that. For, for political purposes. That for for like. I think that it has to do that they were at one point stigmatized. And so at one point they were victims of society. And so, so people now they are victimized by society anymore. So we have to go to the next thing. And the next thing are trans people. Uh, because they were still being victimized, so we can use them uh, for our political goals and sex workers because people still look down on them. And so I think it's just the next subgroup that is still percent accepted for one reason or the other being used by the political left as a, um, almost like a a chariot or something that uh, keeps them that 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 gives them a reason to exist. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it gives them a reason to get votes, uh, you know. Because uh, exactly. to be fair, I think that it's not even sex. As much as they talk about sex work, you know, in this broad stroke thing, I think when most people talk about sex work, quote unquote. They don't mean, you know, actual people doing the work. They have, I think they conjure kind of a romantic idea of like, you know, the hooker with the heart of gold, some poor girl who, you know, she's really, you know, an, she's a totally wonderful person who just <laughs> happens to be in like terrible circumstances. And oh my God, uh, like they're so like, I feel so bad for her. Well, why are we making her feel bad about it? She didn't do anything wrong. It's like they, 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 they're not really thinking about like they're imagining Uma Thurman from Les Misérables. They're not imagining, you know, like star <laughs> star dazzle on the corner of Oakland. <laughs> or even um, cause my dad's girlfriend yeah. actually works at a brothel in Nevada. Like is one of the girls actually, she was telling me this actually cause she's the cashier. She's like the one that's like checking in on them and making sure they're actually doing their job. If you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. she, she's like the Madame without the title. But anyways, she actually, Damn. yeah, anyways, one of the girls actually came out of like their like studio apartment or whatever they have on premises and was like, I'm going to like literally walked out to the bar and was like, and literally said, I'm going to pay my rent with blowjobs today. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh my God. I, I, have, I, I have to say that I found the normalization of um, pornography of sex work um and actually okay controversial i find the not of transgenderism and even the normalization of being gay uh to a certain extent uh problematic um all different topics um but i think that topics comes with problems there are um the amount so for example look let's look at homosexuals um if you are gay you're much more likely to be a drug user and you're much more likely to have mental health issues when you're transgender you're much more likely to have mental health issues and commit suicide uh, when you're a sex worker besides being exposed to uh, um, STDs, um, you will also suffer from mental health issues, um, depression, and it will be very difficult for you in the future to have a normal life. Um, if you're a porn actor, um, you, you posted this one video about this straight guy who did um, um, these like jerk off videos uh, and it destroyed his life. Oh, um, Michael Hoffman, yeah. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. I'm, I mean, each one, like, these these things are so over-glorified. It's like, oh, gay pride, be proud to be gay. Well, it's not as easy as that. It's a, it's It can be a very dangerous subculture. When I came out to my grandmother, she was, like, my brother is gay as well. And um, my brother, but he's very, like, 
the way he says things, he doesn't say, oh, by the way, grandmother, I'm gay. He's like, oh, at the moment, I don't like girls and blah, 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 and I like guys. So my grandmother had a hard time accepting that he was gay because he never actually said it clearly. But when I came out to her, I said, oh, by the way, I have a relationship with a guy. And she had no problem with me being gay. But what she said was, well, but what about AIDS? And what about having a family? And she asked these very specific questions. And I gave her very specific answers. And I, would, I have to say that my grandmother, not being in touch with like gay culture and stuff like that, I think her, all of her questions were very, very valid. And I think these are questions that, people, for example, I think gay people have to think about certain things like what about your health what about mental health same with transgender people where you're like oh well maybe it's not good for a transgender person to take hormones to become more trans maybe you should actually get treatment to become normal more normal maybe you should tell a sex worker that it's not a great job because you will emotionally pay a price for that same with a porn actor i mean I was doing okay as a porn actor because I didn't do any drugs and because I lived in Germany far, far away from the porn industry. But a lot of the porn actors I know, I would say they paid a price for that. Sorry, that was a long, long thing to say. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I think that there, um, I think maybe a simple way of saying is that each one of these lifestyles is an entire lifestyle and it will dramatically dramatically affect your life and so you know unless um unless there's absolutely zero choice like for me um i came out when i was 14 there was no hiding it there's i i have no choice uh to be homosexual if i force myself to have i like to say as a joke um but i'm not really joking um if I had sex with a woman, I would feel like I was raping Tori Amos. Oh, I love Tori Amos. I'm yeah, she's that. she's my favorite artist of all time. Yeah, mine yeah. as well. Mine as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so, um, actually, yeah. I went to I went to London to watch The Light Princess. I I, I don't actually know The Light Princess. Well, is uh, the Light Princess is a uh, um, that's a theater play, a musical that she wrote. It's really good. I I really like it. Oh, I want to see it. So, um, you know, uh, uh, for 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 me, like there is there's no other option. But like, if you're if you're, um, oh, there is. But for you, there is no, no option to how you live your sexuality or, or what what your preferences are. But there is a choice for you. For example, how. Um, how many sex partners you have? Yes, you yes, that's work, true. You that's protect true. Yourself. Yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of ways of you know, like, like, because I, 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 I totally bought into the whole like, uh, I should never do monogamy. I should never, blah blah blah. Like, I um lived in San Francisco, had all sorts of group sex and stuff like that for for a while, and um never quite, you know. And in San Francisco, if you're not having, you know. A, a threesome every couple of months or a foursome, you know, and you're not cool. You might yeah, as well yeah, be more, man. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. not cool. Um, and um, yeah. so um, I and I totally bought into that. And now, you know, like I'm starting to like re-enter into the dating pool, and I'm thinking, like, wait, I think maybe I'd be happier in a monogamous relationship at the moment. You know, like that's, and I'm, I'm not. I'm taking it one step at a time. I'm not committing to what, any, any, what, any, what, any. One step, step, one step, friends. <laughs> The, the thing is, you don't have to be monogamous, but you should be aware of what you're doing. And that's yeah. a huge difference. Um, I, I think that, for example, I have friends that do take drugs. And I'm really anti-drugs. I'm really, really anti-drugs. But when I talk to them, I, I have to say I can respect the way that they take drugs because they take them very controlled. They know exactly why they take a certain thing at this time, not to go to a party and to dance more. They're like, well, I want to have this experience and this moment in a safe environment. And I, and I don't judge them because I'm like, well, 
to me, it sounds like you know what you're doing. That's all I am asking. But this culture of saying, hey, you're gay, that's absolutely amazing. Do whatever you want to have sex with as many people as possible. And don't let Without anybody shame you for using condoms. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, no, but this culture of actually saying that everything is okay. That's fucked up. No, not everything is okay. If you're self-harming yourself and society has to take care of you afterwards, that's not, on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's your fault. You can't just say it, it's a little bit like this fat shaming thing. It's like, oh, I don't take care about my body at all, but then I want the I, I want the government to pay for my health bills and I want everybody to feel sorry for me and I don't want anybody to shame me. Sorry, you can't have it both ways. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. And that is actually one of the, again, one of the, if we're going to do a binary on the left, right thing, the fact, the biggest, I think maybe the single biggest divide between left and right mentalities, again, in broad strokes is relativism versus uh, truth or goodness like there's no normal in uh in the far left circles everything's subjective everything is equally good whereas like there's no healthy or unhealthy everything everyone just sort of lives in sort of a mist of their own you know reality is a spectrum kind oh, of there's thing. all sorts of unhealthy anything that is normally considered normal is unhealthy true, true. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, being in a straight relationship that's that's the devil you can't mm -hmm. do that no. Yeah. And, and being good at stuff, being hardworking, and ending, you know, like making a little bit of extra money. How dare you? And having a penis. Save other people for being mediocre. And ha and having a penis. That that's that's really bad. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But um, so did we finish, Kat? Yeah, I think, so. I think that's good. Because, so yes. So because I had um um, I uh was gonna say that um. I, um, at some point, uh, was potentially going to work at a, a female strip club and, um, you know, I was going to, I wasn't going to be a bouncer. I was going to be one of the other staff members and, and mm -hmm. one of the more important ones. Um, and they really, really wanted me. It turned out, you know, because I have a lot of experience with sex workers and, you know, the thing is, uh, they, their favorite workers to do you know like everything aside from being on stage they want it to be gay guys ideally you know because they want it to, and especially because i i look very masculine i'm about six foot two i have tattoos and you know it's like oh okay so you know um if, if if a guy starts creeping out on a girl and i give him a dirty look he's going to get a little bit more scared than if one of the other girls does so that you know that yeah. as soon as i'm there they're like oh my god women shaming. You're, you're not empowering women well, no, no, no. They were they were fine with. Um, I'm just kidding. Okay, so they wanted to hire me. They like I could tell that within ten minutes or less than ten minutes, like within two minutes of talking to me, they wanted to hire me. It was very, very obvious, and um, and I forgot that you know in Seattle where I live, Seattle is a very, very feminist city. It is like the is it the feminist city? It's there's I would say that it's one of the top three if you were to take um Portland, Portland. um <laughs> Portland. Port, Portland and then Berkeley. The, yeah, probably Berkeley. Port Portland, Berkeley, Seattle are about tied. Um the Trinity. Yeah, yeah, and, and in different in different ways. Um and so Seattle is more prudish and there's only a few strip places and everything. And there's even these like really, really like intense laws where um, like, for example, you don't, you, you can have private dances, but you don't actually have, um, um, you, you can have private dances, but you don't actually get lap dances. Lap dances are illegal. So the girl can only be within three feet of the guys. So they, they, the, the guy can pay about $20 for this girl to go in the back and dance three feet away from him. So obviously the, um, the girls are breaking that rule, but that's the way. And, 
and that type of thing probably came from the feminists because there there is no republican presence in um seattle all of the puritanism is um that would be anti-sex and anti-sex work would be coming from the feminist side and so i what's what's funny though is is that because of that, you know, there's there's all of this, you know, I'm sure there's the, the, the type of girls who are into like, don't slut shame. Let's, I don't know if they have slut walks in Seattle. They might. Um, but it's there's definitely that mentality of like slut shaming is bad. We're pro sex. We're feminists, except for they're not. They're they're really not pro sex. Like they're they're not they're not um, accepting of the type of girls that heterosexual men are attracted to earning of course, of course earning. Not. The thing yeah. is, the, the slut walk, that is only about women sexualizing themselves, but not for anybody else. So yeah, it's I unattractive want, women. I want, I want to dress as sexy as I want. But don't but look I at me. I want you to look at me unless I find you attractive. Well, no, it's, it's, also, it's also like, I'm going to dress as you know, naked with black tape on my nipples, even though I'm fucking unattractive because I'm a feminist. And so suck it. That's, that's the mentality. And, but, 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 but when it comes to young, attractive women trying to earn a living at a strip club, the feminists don't like them very much. And I, and I remember. They hate them. Did, yeah, did you know that? Did you know that they banned the grit girls here in? Uh, oh yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So and, and, I, and all the and all the grit girls, they they went on TV shows and they're like, "Hey, sorry, I, I'm actually a medical student and like I have a degree. I'm smart, but I want to do that and it's empowering." And now these feminists tell us that we can't do that anymore. How it, dare them? But yeah. It's, yeah, they just told them that they had internalized misogyny. You just yeah, hate yourself. So I, I was recently thinking that you know it would it, it would be almost worthwhile for me to have um, to go and try to get that job again, even though I basically turned it down. You know, like they wanted me to come back in and maybe get trained or something, and I just never came back. Um, you know, like um, but I was almost thinking like um, uh, it, it it would almost be worth me. Um, if I had ever had have the time to try to get that job and, you know, to be a positive role model for those girls in the way that I could say, look, I've known a lot of sex workers and um, I know that it was not, you know, when you were a nine year old girl, you were not thinking that you were going to do this. This was not going to be your plan. And I don't want to. I don't want to be too nice or too harsh. I don't want to be a jerk. I don't want to make you feel bad about yourself. But I also don't want to, you know, be like Mr. Pro Sex. This is the best choice ever. Because ultimately, do you want to see yourself trying to dance like this in ten years? I don't think that you probably do. And would I want to try to offer them once, advice. Once you, have, once, once you have once you have a daughter, would you want your daughter to do the same thing? And for how long would you want your daughter to do that? To do that? Yeah, and I don't think that those girls are getting people. You know, like like I'm I'm 36. I don't think that there's that many gay guys who are 36 that have known sex workers for for over 15 years that are going to be are, are just going to tell them the truth <laughs> you know in that in that kind of way and so you know it's like it's like if i oh if i only have time i think i could i could be a positive influence on some of these girls but i don't that, that's that's <laughs> what i tried back then as german mr leather and then also to a certain extent in the porn industry um whenever i gave an interview i did I did criticize the the gay community for not really addressing the drug problems and actually the and I attacked the gay community for being internally hateful so that the lesbians would be against the gays the masculine gays would be against the feminine gays and stuff like that so I I used my my publicity for similar things to bringing in an unusual view, um, and that worked for a while. Um, and that worked to a point where I saw that I just didn't fit into this community at all. Um, 
And I think that happened when I started uh, women. And to me, it was so normal that I said in an interview, oh, by the way, I started women again. And then I started to get death threats uh, from the gay community. <laughs> so I, really? think it's, I, I think it's great when if you go there and start working there and try to give these girls a different view because they might not get it from anywhere else but you might only be able to do that for a certain amount of time before the environment might get too hostile oh well i i, I have a feeling um just knowing the place that it was um i had a feeling they would have really appreciated it just so, because it, it was not the kind of place where there was any sort of politics it was mm -hmm. just girls 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 sketchy um you know guys mostly well over 40 looking at all the girls like they wanted to stick their dick in them um all creepy you know like it that's, um that's I, I, what you guys do yeah but but <laughs> you know like i don't think that there was any positive role models or anybody that was you know talking to them about any you know i think it was all just money like this is what they had to do to survive and yeah. is, is what it what it seemed like and so like you know i mean mostly mm -hmm. i would have just been nice like mostly i would have treated the, like i would have gone in there if if i had gotten a job i would have been like look i don't drink or do drugs anymore um i used to but i don't so if we are going to be friends and maybe i will kind of make friends with some of you uh don't invite me out to go drinking or especially if there's going to be any sort of drugs there because if i show up with you guys and you are talking about buying some cocaine i will never go out with you again so uh -huh. if you if, if you want to invite me out for some girl's birthday or something you can go right ahead but that's the rules um because well, i want i, I want to have that's a, a, uh, that that's a tricky thing because if if you close this uh door for good if you're that strict then um, you might push them away completely, which means that you also push away your positive influence. So sometimes you have to balance that and say, well, I will be there or I can be there, but I will never support it. And you have to deal with the fact that I'm against what you're doing. And sometimes that's better than being completely strict. Well, but for me, it's that I used to actually do drugs, and okay. so I can't be around it. Like, it's like I, if, if, if I, you know, like, let's say it's some girl's birthday, and she says, yeah, I would really like you to come out. You've been so nice since you've been working here. Uh, we're going to go and have some some drinks. I'll be like, I could have a few drinks, you know, because I, I, I will drink. I mostly don't. Yeah. You know, I drink a few times a month, but I just not often. And uh, I go out and then all of a sudden they're getting cocaine and they're they're offering me some. I would be uh, I would be kind of mad. I'd be like, yeah, I told you, you know, like I can't be around that. Um, I wouldn't even be mad. It would have just been more like, I, OK, I, I'm never going to go out with you again because that's what happened last time. And I don't want to be. And but I was but I would make that very, very clear to all yeah. of the girls like look, I do have one pretty strict rule. It doesn't mean I don't like you. Like, I know, like, you know, like, I have known sex workers for about, you know, probably 20 years or so. And um, uh, maybe not 20, no, not 20 years, but, you know, like 15 years or so. Um, and uh, it's like, I, I've, I, I would be completely naive to think that, you know, like on any given night, there's 20 girls dancing at this place. I would be completely, completely naive to assume that any less than 50% uh, are probably doing cocaine every once in a while because I know sex workers. Like that's just like silly for me to imagine that these girls aren't going out and doing cocaine when they get off of work. Because they you probably don't want to be part of that. Yeah, yeah. And so I would just make it very, very clear. Like, you know, like, hey, I have no problem with you guys doing it i'm just just if i ever go out with you which is going to be very rare it have to be on your birthday or something like that i will go out with you but only invite me if you're positive that it's not going to be there and that's part of you know and just make it a very established rules because and I, and I would also say like hey and if there's too much of this stuff if you guys don't respect that about me i will quit and you guys you guys want because I, I i could just tell like all the girls like when I was hanging out and, you know, they, they showed me how the place worked and everything. So I was there for about an hour and a half. 
um, all the girls were like so eager to meet me and they're like, oh, you could tell that they all thought I was maybe going to work with them and they were all excited, you know, and it was like, if I were to make some very clear rule, they would, they would, they would respect it. They would have respected it. And it would have, it would have been kind of a, a, you know, a a nice, a a nice way to, um, uh, to teach them some limits and some boundaries. Um, so, yeah. To, to wrap this uh, to wrap this up, uh, just yeah. one last question: What kept uh, what kept you from doing this job again? Um, there was a lot of things. There was a. Uh, Did was they want large... you to use the polls, Prince? No, no. It, it was largely <laughs> no. It was largely that I didn't really need the job all that much yeah. at that time. Um, it was sort of a convenience thing. Like, um, I thought that maybe I could work part time, and they wanted me to work a little bit more often than I was going to be willing to, or than I was prepared for. And then um, some other stuff came up in my life anyway. So I I would be even less available. So I just didn't go back. Um, You know, it was like, I was thinking, hopefully I could do um, once a week or maybe once every other week. And they were hoping for three days a week. And I was like, "Eh." (laughs) that's, that's pretty much it, you know? Um, and that was a while ago, so it's not like um, I uh, even know if the option's still open. So, shall we? Shall we call it a night? Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm. I'm ready. It was. It was wonderful talking to you. Absolutely. Uh, I, I hope this won't be the last time. I would love to be uh, on the show as often as possible. If if you are interested in having me, sometimes I don't know uh, if you have guests quite often, uh, but I would love to be a part of this more often. Yeah, if yeah. Gay, if I'm if I'm gay enough for you guys, no, no you <laughs> certainly are. You would you'd be um, definitely um, welcome at some point in the future, um, and uh, we we kind of um, uh, we'll, we'll, how about we talk about this off air for a little bit? Sure. We'll do that. Okay. Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for tuning me. It was a pleasure talking to you guys. Bye. Bye.